Chapter 471, Conjuration. Roy's instinct told him to get that glimmering spell tome from Farangar. The writing was incomprehensible to him, but he could observe it. Spell tome, conjure familiar a record of Farangar's experience with this spell. Should you possess an aptitude for magic, you will acquire this spell after using the tome. That one was the cheapest in Farangar's collection of novice spell tomes. A hundred gold for one spell book. Are you sure that's a good transaction, Goldeneye? Flynn shook his head in disapproval, like he was the one spending the money, not Roy. Farangar's secret fire held the lesser soul gem. If you don't have the aptitude for magic, that tome would be a waste of money. But if you do have the aptitude for it, you should join the Mage's College in Winterhold. They'll teach you magic, systematically. He can't understand you, wizard. Pity I don't have telepathy. Roy ignored their advice. He tore the book in two, and a cloud of blue smoke rose into the air, brushing across his face. Roy inhaled all of the smoke through his mouth, and a tingly sensation coursed through his head. A mountain of words, sounds, and scenes welled in his mind. They weren't shown in the language of this world. Instead, they were shown to his heart. No understanding of language was needed. Farangar was standing in the void, his hands and legs split apart, and he assumed a bizarre stance. His robe and locks billowed in the winds of Magicka, but the mage was unfazed. With his hands, he made a gesture in the air, and Magicka converged on his fingertips. The explanation for the moves Farangar was making boomed through the void over and over again, but the Witcher, who had never learned this world's magic, did not understand. But he could understand Farangar's gesture, how Magicka flowed in his body, and most importantly, the translucent rune covered in spindly patterns. It resembled a door of green flames, and three numbers were engraved on it. Roy saw it all, and he injected Magicka into that rune, much like how Farangar did. It felt like he was opening a door leading to a world hitherto unknown to him, and his soul entered the door, just like his mana did. For one moment, he saw countless balls of light shining beyond the door, responding happily to his call like lively creatures. Farangar and Flynn didn't see anything just yet. All they saw was Roy standing with his eyes closed, and they felt his breathing slow. All of a sudden, the Witcher extended his left hand and pointed at the clearing in the center of the room. Magicka gathered before him. Five seconds later, a spinning blue sphere scurried forth out of nowhere. At first, it was but the size of a fist, but it quickly expanded and enveloped the room. Then, finally, that ball of blue light disappeared. What took its place was a bizarre black wolf the size of a calf. Its muscles were sturdy, and its eyes burned like flaming rubies. Its teeth were sharp and dangerous, strips of flesh dangling from them, and its rancid drool dripped onto the rug of the room. The monster looked as if it had just returned from a hunt. Hellhound, age, eight years old. Gender, male. Status, familiar, resides in the plains of oblivion. HP, 80 magica. 80 Strength, 5 Constitution, 6 Dexterity, 9 Perception, 9 Will, 5 Charisma, 4 Spirits, 6 Skills, 5 or 2 Costs a minor amount of Magicka, combines Magicka with a sulfuric gas within its body to produce a stream of flame, can inflict burning. Daedroth, Passive, Hellhounds reside in a plane that has more Magicka but is also more brutal, plus 20 to Magicka and HP. I, I did it? Roy's gaze flickered quickly between his familiar and his fingertips. Back in the Witcher world, he could never cast any spells. At most, he could use signs, but those didn't count. But that limitation didn't seem to exist in the world of Tamriel. The special attributes of Magicka and Conjuration seemed to have closed the gap between Roy and a real mage. Aside from spending 50 points of mana on the summoning, Roy also lost 5 EXP. The mana was used to open the door, while the EXP was payment for summoning the Hellhound. After performing that spell, the rune for it seemed to grow a bit more solid in form, as if it had just gone through a bit of training. Every time Roy cast the spell, the rune would grow more solid, and the spell would eventually level up. And there was a new skill in the character sheet. Conjuration Level 1, currently mastered Conjure Familiar. Conjured Familiar, most basic conjuration spell. Expends 50 mana and 5 EXP, pure soul. Summons a hellhound from oblivion that follows your every command. Can hunt down your target or join you in battle. The familiar lasts for 5 minutes. 
you may only have one familiar at a time. You may banish it before its time is up. The more proficient you are with this spell, the less mana you will expend, and the longer your familiar can linger. Note, do not hurt your familiar. Constant abuse of your familiar will eventually render this spell useless. A bluish-purple light glowed around the hellhound, weakening little by little. Once that light was fully extinguished, the hellhound would return to the plane called Oblivion. Roy could feel a connection between him and the hellhound. The creature was submitting to him and would follow his every command. Come here and lie down. The hellhound stuck its barbed tongue out and lay beneath Roy's feet, licking his boots. And then it got up, turned around, and barked a little. All on Roy's orders, of course. It performed everything perfectly like a good little lackey, and it made Roy happy. Realization shone in Flynn's eyes. So Goldeneye is both a good warrior and a mage. No wonder he picked the mage. Congratulations on your first successful conjuration. You're a born conjurer. Ferengar nodded approvingly at the delighted Witcher. He then pointed at the Hellhound, and a stream of magicka poured forth. A flash of light surrounded Roy's Hellhound. It let out one last howl of frustration before disappearing into thin air. Roy's lips twitched. Was that an exorcism? Conjurers are looked down upon by the Nordlings in Skyrim, Goldeneye. Some of the more short-tempered ones won't hesitate to beat you up if you perform a conjuring. Donut, under any circumstances, show anyone this skill, unless absolutely necessary. A hint of melancholy filled Ferengar's eyes, and Dragon's Reach has a no-magic rule, but I won't punish you for your first offense. Flynn, do remind him constantly. I'll do my best, Flynn said. I don't look down on mages, though. Ferengar nodded. Then to his surprise, that Goldeneye fellow was whipping out a small pile of herbs. Common herbs seen everywhere, however. Ah, it seems I have misjudged you. You already have a storage bag. No wonder you managed to master a conjuration spell. But what are you doing? Trying to sell me this garbage? Ferengar's lips twitched, but Roy only shrugged. Fine, I can use these. Two gold, an offer made to friends. Despite the low offer, Roy nodded. Two gold wasn't enough for another spell tome, but he could always save up. Ferengar had a lot of items Roy really wanted, and these herbs were just common things Roy found by the roadside. He could use Observe to get some valuable things to sell. That's all for business. You have your task and location. Chop, chop, Ferengar was chasing them off. If you're fast, you might make it back by tomorrow. I'm open to doing business if you have any soul gems or valuable spoils. Common herbs don't count. Wizard, did the Jarl give you permission to send out some soldiers with us? Flynn asked nervously. Or better yet, did he give you permission to come with us? Franger slowly scanned the two of them, and he sighed. Then the wizard whipped out a couple of crimson bottles from his rack, the liquid within glimmering beautifully. One healing potion for each of you, on the house. That's the most I can do. Potion of minor healing, heals 20 HP upon usage, can heal minor wounds. Roy handed both potions to Flynn. Activate and Swallow were a lot more potent than these potions, after all. Roy and Flynn left the city almost as soon as they came. When they arrived back at Riverwood, Irilith and her soldiers were already patrolling the area. They asked around and got the exact location of Bleak Falls Barrow, and the duo set off for their mission. Through the stone bridge in the west of Riverwood did they cross, and then, they passed a small hill. A bolt flew through the air, Maul hitting the wolf hiding behind the bush of thistles. It leaped out of its hiding spot, howling in pain. The bolt destroyed its left front ankle, but it valiantly hobbled backward, leaving a trail of blood behind. It was then a burly, honest-looking man in leather armor charged right at it with a steel sword, cutting away at its rear and torso. And then the wolf fell, taking its last breath in a pool of its own blood. Flynn heaved a sigh of relief, wiping off a drop of sweat from his forehead, but a look of excitement flared openly in his eyes. He wasn't skilled enough to fight a soldier, but what skill he did have was enough to handle a beast. Roy went past his companion, holding a hand crossbow. He nodded at Flynn before they resumed their journey to the mountaintop. The higher they went, the fewer plants they saw, and the temperature dipped fast. Snow was starting to cover the ground, and barely any beasts were prowling around this area. But even though he was wearing sleeveless leather armor, Flynn was unfazed. 
Nordlings were born with a thick hide and great resistance to cold weather after all. Roy was a lot sturdier than most people, so the cold failed to affect him as well. Once they reached the mountainside, a structure made of gigantic black stones began unfurling before them. It was a temple seemingly made in ancient times. Roy curled up a little, resembling a cat on high alert. He came to a stop, giving Flynn the signal to stay quiet. They tiptoed to the wide, ancient stairs and hid in a bush beside it, observing the temple. A few men in furry armor, arm guards, and boots stood beneath the temple's pillars. Some had warhammers strapped on their backs, some were equipped with swords, while some had shields on their arms. Another man with a bow on his back stood atop the temple's roof, staring at his surroundings sharply, much like a falcon. The witcher patiently surveyed his enemies, confirming that there were six of them guarding the place. All possessed similar stats of those imperial soldiers in Helgen. They're the bandits? Flynn held the hilt of Gwihire. He borrowed that from Goldeneye. Tightly, his body shivering, his eyes gleaming with anxiety and excitement. If this were the old him, Flynn would have run as far away as possible from any bandit. But that line had long since been crossed. The Dragonborn had taken a path hitherto unimaginable to him, for my home in Whiterun. Roy produced an exquisite hand crossbow and stared at the roof of the temple. He pointed at the bandit on the right, the one with an axe, and pointed at Flynn's chest. The dragonborn nodded and tensed up, preparing for what was to come. A bolt hurtled through the air and bore a hole through the bowman on the roof. Blood splattered everywhere, his body flying backward. The remaining bandits shouted and roared as they unsheathed their weapons and charged at the intruders. Two more bolts were fired. Two of the bandits were sent flying backward, a hole boring through their bodies. The moment they fell to the ground was the moment they drew their last breath. Flynn was awestruck. I haven't even drawn my sword yet, and he's already taken out half the enemies? He's a swordsman, a mage, and an archer? But there was no time to indulge in his thoughts. A gust of wind came as the bandit with a warhammer swung his weapon down at him. Flynn swung Gwar up, clashing with the warhammer's metal, and the blade was swatted away. The dragonborn felt a great surge of power coursing through his hand. He almost lost his grip on the weapon, but for some reason, he held on. Anne, D the dragonborn quickly retreated. Yet the bandit did not relent. To Flynn's horror, the warhammer was brought down on him once more. A blue rune shone in the air. The gust of air that darted out of it slammed into the chest of the bandit, trying to swing his greatsword down on the witcher, and the bandit fell backward. Roy took a half-step back, easily dodging the shield bash of another bandit. He quickly made a rune in the air and shoved it into the bandit's eyes, plunging him into a stupor. Then Arendite drew an arc across the air, beheading that bandit. A headless corpse with a shield and sword in its hands fell before the witcher. Once again, the bandit with a great sword leaped back into the fray, swinging his sword up diagonally. Roy took one step forward, evading the blade easily. The bandit, all of a sudden, lost sight of the witcher, and then he felt his calves being severed by the witcher's blade. He lost all balance and fell forward, and the last thing he felt was a sting on his nape. Then he fell headfirst into the snow, and he stopped moving. The bandit with a warhammer was still engaged in battle with Flynn. Despite his lack of experience with weaponry, Flynn was talented with them. He was growing at a blistering speed. With Roloff's teachings and Roy's demonstration, the young dragonborn already had a vague grasp of the basics of swordplay, his movements slowly becoming more streamlined, though only barely, and he had higher stats too. Even though it might look like the bandit was overpowering him, he had yet to injure Flynn even a little. On the other hand, Flynn would dish out counterattacks of his own every time the bandit showed an opening. Gwihar easily cut open his leather armor and left deep wounds on the bandit. The bandit's movements became slower and slower as he lost more blood, yet Flynn remained healthy and his eyes were gleaming. His strength was still abundant. Then, for one split second, there was an opening Flynn could exploit, and exploit it he did. The dragonborn cut the warhammer's handle in two, stunning the bandit, and that was his fatal mistake. Flynn swung the blade across his neck, slitting his throat, Blood spurted out into the air and the bandit gurgled as he fell to the ground. That felt good.
Flynn wiped off the blood from his cheeks, a smile of delight curling his lips. He's improving. Fast. Roy was a little surprised. Barely two days had gone by, and Flynn already had basic swordplay among his repertoire. Is he actually a genius? They cleaned up the battlefield and looted the bandits for everything they had. And then they found a wooden crate in the bandits' nearby lair. Roy swung his blade down on the lock and opened the crate, revealing fifty gold and a potion of minor healing within it. Alchemical items are really widespread here, huh? You basically took all of them out yourself. Take the gold. Flynn took the potion and turned his head away after glancing at the gold coins for a moment. Riches and wealth. Wars were waged over less, and yet Roy still shared the gold with Flynn, and he would not take no for an answer. Flynn was grateful for that gesture, but unbeknownst to him, Roy had already taken all the bandit's weapons. He could sell them all to the blacksmith in Whiterun and spend his gold on Ferengar's merchandise. Flynn cracked a smile and opened the doors to the temple. Chapter 472 Bleak Falls Barrow Flynn lit up a torch, illuminating an ancient, spacious hall before the adventurers. Stone pillars with a hue of green covering their surface held up the cobweb-filled ceilings. It was a grave for many unfortunate critters and bugs, all of which were dried, empty husks of their former selves. Vines slithered out of the cracks in the walls like snakes, extending across the ground to reach the other side of the hall. The dragonborn shifted his attention to a corner of the hall. There, behind a pillar, stood a single silhouette, the silhouette of a beast half the size of an adult man. Oblivious of the adventurer's intrusion, the beast crouched low to the ground, clawing away at the air. Upon seeing the countenance of the beast, Flynn almost leapt in surprise, yet he remained still and calm, exchanging a look with the witcher. An understanding was reached, and the adventurers slowly closed in on their quarry. It was then the beast finally noticed the intruders. An ear-piercing shriek rattled the great chamber as the beast emerged from its hiding place. A skeever. Rodents the size of a hunting dog. Covered in gray fur, and its claws were sharp enough to tear through flesh easily. The beast glared at the intruders with its crimson eyes, the feral desire to hunt welling within them. Even though its enemies were armed, the skeever charged right at them without fear or fervor, a screech escaping its snout. Alas, that was the last thing it would do in its beastly life. The dragonborn brought down his sword on the incoming rodent, easily slicing it in two. Blood spurted out of the two halves of its corpse, covering the ground in red. The dead skeever writhed and spasmed for a moment. Then it went dead, unmoving. What is this place? Or to be exact, what was? Flynn surveyed his surroundings. We got bandits guarding the gates, and the first thing we run into is a rat the size of a dog. How did it even get so big anyway? Not like there's anything to eat here. Gods, that thing could kill a cat easily. Saber cats aside, anyway. Then, a momentary pause swooped down on Flynn. Mate, I have a bad feeling about this. Something more dangerous slumbers in the depths of this place. But the witcher paid him no heed. Instead, he hunkered down and cut off the skeever's tail. To his surprise, this tail was also an alchemical component. Flynn's lips twitched, though he said nothing about the witcher's odd behavior. It was not the first time his companion exhibited an almost bizarre curiosity about all manner of beasts and greenery. Oftentimes, he would stop for a moment just to harvest leaves and vines and animal parts, tucking them away in his seemingly bottomless sack. And then, they were off again. This time, they came face to face with a dark, narrow passageway. The witcher harvested some luminous mushrooms off the walls before he followed his companion into a room that was almost fully closed off. These must be the traps Ferengar talked about. Frustrated, Flynn massaged his temples. Standing at the far end of this chamber was a steel gate. A lever sat before it, and on the left side of the temple were three obelisks they could spin. Gods, we're not even mages. Cracking this is going to take a whole day. No. Flynn was wrong. The witcher scanned his surroundings, especially the two stone slabs over the locked gate and the lone slab on the first floor, seemingly fallen from its place. And the witcher stepped ahead, spinning the obelisks on the room's left side. Before long, the obelisks showed, from left to right, the pattern of a snake, a snake, and a dolphin. Then the witcher pulled the lever, and as if by magic, 
the steel gate slowly rattled upward, revealing a path behind it. Filled with awe and shock, the dragonborn gawked at his companion, a hue of a shamed red tinging his cheeks. I looked at the chamber, and all I saw was a chamber. He looked at the chamber, and he solved a puzzle. Am I stupid? The dragonborn shut that thought down almost as immediately as it arose. Nah. Golden Eye's just too smart. I've seen him do great things. Probably nothing he can't do. Despite the clear path ahead, Roy was in no hurry to pass. Instead, he put one leg forward and extended an arm, assuming a weird spellcasting stance. Then, the Witcher pointed at the ground, pouring part of his mana into the rune of Conjure Familiar that was deeply embedded in his mind. Five points of EXP were deducted as well, but in exchange, a ball of blue light emerged from his fingertip. As if it were a key, it opened the door to an unknown realm, summoning a hellhound bigger than the skeever they ran into earlier. The creature was sitting on its hind legs, letting out a languid yawn that revealed its terrible, gleaming teeth. The creature was resting when Roy summoned it to this chamber. Its summoner gave it an order, and the hound stood up, shaking his body. Happily, it charged into the path beyond the steel gates to check for any threats. It did not take long for the hound to come back. It barked softly, telling its summoner the way ahead was clear of any danger. Only then did the witcher tell his companion to go through the gate, and they were greeted by dusty wooden racks and porcelain jars. This place gives me the creeps, and it looks like a tomb. Are, are these jars grave goods, and the smell of these cloths? Phew, smell like shrouds, Tim. The sentence was never finished. Roy shut him up by showing off a gold coin he found in a jar. Galvanized, the adventurers went to work, scouring the chamber for every single valuable they could get their hands on. Two streaks of silver arced across the air, slamming the corpses of two skeevers into the walls of these chambers. A hole was bored through their heads, claiming their lives almost instantly. The hellhound chomped down on the throat of a third skeever. The rodent screeched and screamed, but there was nothing it could do. Eventually, death came for it. Flynn swung his sword down, cleaving a fourth skeever in two. He then flicked his wrist around, his eyes fixated on the maze of paths that was unfurling before him. Sleeping around him were droves of black, ancient caskets. I knew it. This place is a mass burial ground. Or was a mass burial ground. Some were embedded in the walls of the chamber, while some stood upright. And these caskets were not empty. No, something slept within them. Corpses. Hideous corpses. These corpses must have been dead for years now, yet streaks of flesh hung off their bones like they were dried cadavers. The skin and muscles of the corpses were all but rotten, leaving behind a visage so gaunt it could traumatize a child should one lay their eyes on them. The corpses donned sleeveless metal armor as if they were warriors, and within their hands slept their rusty weapons. Great swords, battle axes, long swords, axes, shields, and even bows and arrows. Had they been alive, the adventurers could imagine just how majestic these corpses would be. And then, realization struck Flynn. He knew who these corpses were, and he spared them a look of respect. Ancient Nordling warriors. He wished to pay them due respect, but Roy held him back. The Witcher shook his head and turned his attention to the Hound. With its orders made clear, the Hell Hound charged at the caskets, but before it could reach any single one, the dead sprang to life ready to cut down those who would dare wake them from their long slumber. The sound of bones rattling and grazing off one another echoed through the hallway as the seemingly dead corpse was rising back to life. It cracked its neck and held its weapon tightly as it stood, ready to face the living. And yet before it could cut down the intruders, a crossbow bolt was flung through the air. It slammed into the draugr's chest like a sledgehammer, and the monster crashed back into its casket, stirring up a cloud of dust in the air of the hallway. Half of its head was blown off, bits of crimson flesh hanging from its skull. Sickly green brain matter oozed from the wound on its head, and yet it hung on to life, or unlife, in this matter. T, he light of all that was unholy glinted in its remaining eye, tethering it to the land of the living. Roy stared at his adversary, once again casting, observed to glean more information. Draugr status, ancient Nordling, Member of the Dragon Cult. Strength 9. Dexterity 5. Constitution 9. Perception 4. Will 6. Charisma 3. Spirit 5. Skills 
war cry, chains of the unliving. Passive, draugrs are creatures under the influence of a special spell. Bound to their mortal shells, these creatures fear no pain or wound. They possess no exploitable weaknesses either. With no bodily limitations chaining them down, these creatures can use all the strength that is locked within the human body. But in exchange, they move and react slower than they did in life. Plus one to strength and constitution, mine of one to dexterity. Frost resistance, basic swordplay level eight, blessing of the stars, the warrior. The hellhound leapt into the air and chomped down on a draugr's neck, breathing flames upon its body. The snake of flames slithered up to the draugr's head, pinching out the fire of unlife within its eyes. More draugrs were on their way. Flynn crouched a little, holding his sword tightly. Another draugr came charging at the dragonborn, swinging its axe around viciously. Roy fired a bolt and destroyed its head without a moment of hesitation. Draugr killed, plus 40 EXP. The witcher arched his eyebrows. Too slow. This is going to take forever to settle. Hound, you're up. The hellhound darted forward like a bolt of black lightning, passing through the draugr's legs. Into the dark passage, the hellhound ran, loud barks echoing through the stale, dank air. The provocation worked. Draugrs slumbering within the ancient, dusty caskets shuffled and turned. They tore away the cobwebs lingering above their caskets, rising back to life for a singular purpose. To kill those that had woken them from their slumber. The armed draugrs huddled together as they slowly gave chase after the hellhound. Armor and weapons clanged, and bones screeched as they mashed against one another. More than twenty draugrs went after the hellhound, jostling and shuffling. Blue flames of undeath shone within their eyes, seemingly drifting through the air as the undead walked toward their quarry. Try as they might, the passage failed to fit more than two corpses, and the undead bodies were forced to stand single file. Yet, that did not deter them from their hunt. Even though the hellhound tried its best to run away, wounds were steadily accumulating on its body. Eventually, one draugr brought its sword down on the creature and sent it straight back to oblivion. Roy's face fell. He shot the nervous dragonborn a look, telling him to stay back. With his hand, the witcher made the sign of clamp. A black rune floated in the air, stirring up a wave of magicka. Then, an entity that bore the same appearance as the witcher leapt out of the rune. It took the hand crossbow Roy tossed over and fired off at the incoming draugrs. Shock and awe took over Flynn's mind, his eyes darting between the two golden eyes standing in front of him. What is going on? Why are there two of them? Is this some kind of magic? He had a lot of questions, but Roy wasn't planning to answer any of them. The witcher produced Arendite and held it in his right hand. Golden light flowed upon the surface of his skin, and the kaleidoscopic halo of Yerdon glimmered beneath his feet. Into the path of the oncoming draugrs, the witcher leapt. Standing before the passageway, the witcher tossed a bolt of electricity over the head of the leading draugr. The bolt of electricity had gained great strength compared to how it was in the witcher world. Purple electricity leapt and danced between the undead corpses, electrocuting them. Five draugrs were sent into a fit of spasms and convulsions, stopping short of the witcher. The witcher swung Arendite down, and all of its runes dimmed. In exchange, a great energy attack hurtled across the passageway. The moment it touched the draugr's armor, the energy attack slee said through them as easily as a hot knife cutting through butter. As the attack disappeared in the distance, all the incoming draugrs slowly came apart, their blood and innards raining down on the ground. Two halves of their bodies fell, the flames of undeath flickering for a moment before they disappeared forever into eternity. And then... Silence. Draugr's killed. EXP 800. Level 12 Witcher. 1900 2500. Roy flicked off the blood on his blade, breathing heavily. Once again, the runes on Arendite shone and brimmed with the life of all the undead it had killed. This place is crawling with draugr's. But they're slow, and these narrow passageways are the only place they can pass through. So, it's another EXP farm. Roy flicked his blade and deflected an incoming arrow as he darted off to the nearest pair of draugrs, and he thrust his blade forward. At the same time, Flynn and the Illusion were fighting off three draugrs that were trying to surround them from behind. The battle lasted for about five minutes. 
our adventurers managed to loot 200 gold from these monsters, and once again they split it evenly. Roy looted all the monsters' weapons and tucked them away in his inventory space. I'll deal with them once we get back to Whiterun. Rusty, but they just need a little touch-up. Must be worth something. And I still have space for more. Inventory can probably keep about a few hundred of these. In most cases, exploration of these tunnels would be dangerous, but with Roy and the team, it was nothing but a cinch. The Witcher would summon his Hellhound and send it off to scout out the path yet unknown to them. Traps were aplenty, but Roy could easily blink away and solve all the puzzles required to deactivate the traps. Nothing could stand in their way, though the Hellhound only could stay in this plane of existence for a limited amount of time. But it was no matter to the Witcher. All he had to do when the Hellhound was sent back to Oblivion was to conjure it once more. A small amount of his EXP would be sacrificed for every conjuring, but it was nothing in the face of what Roy could gain in return. Every time Roy went through a quarter of his mana reserves, he would meditate for half an hour to replenish it, while the Dragonborn would keep an eye out for any potential danger. With every conjuring, the rune in Roy's head was steadily solidifying. The adventurers, Illusion Roy and their Hellhound, made for a fearsome team in these tunnels. The Hellhound would act as bait and attract a big group of dumb, slow-moving draugers into the narrow tunnels, forcing them to stand in a single file. Every time a new group of undead showed up, Roy would cast Quen and swing an energy slash down the tunnels, killing off the living dead easily before they could even come near the Witcher. Flynn and the Illusion Roy took up the rear guard, killing off the corpses that would try to surround them. Five hours flew by, and our adventurers managed to gain a good haul in these dark tunnels, illuminated by nothing but sconces. Roy gained more than 50 weapons and 300 gold. Flynn, too, gained 300 gold from the adventure, and by sheer luck, he found a lesser soul gem on their way. It took a lot of convincing on his part before Roy would take it, and with that, all the draugers were killed off. Covered in blood, Flynn huffed and puffed, looking around him. On the ground were the fallen draugers, and he was merely nicked in the battle. The wounds on his shoulder and legs went away with a health potion. And after all these battles, the dragonborn grew from an inexperienced country boy into a slightly experienced adventurer, one who could hold his own in minor battles, and it filled him with a little pride. The dragonborn turned his attention to his companion, who was not out of breath at all. It was all thanks to him that this journey was a smooth one, the dragonborn thought, or I would have been dead ten times over. And he's a noble man. I barely did anything in battle, but he still shared half of the earnings with me. A hint of worship flickered in the dragonborn's eyes. In his very limited life experience, none could measure up to Goldeneye. His friend was a noble soul and a master of magic, swordplay, and archery, He's probably stronger than Ulfric Stormcloak, who was rumored to have killed High King Torig in a fair duel. And then, a sudden thought popped in his mind. Perhaps Goldeneye might be able to kill the dragon that terrorized Helgen. The dragonborn clenched his fists, and I'm going with him. Through the winding tunnels our adventurers went. Before long, they were faced with a chamber. A chamber with layers of cobwebs covering its entrance. The adventurers stopped in their tracks, and Roy put a finger to his lips. The Witcher stared at the thick layers of cobwebs extending from the low ceiling that hung overhead. They were gleaming a menacing white, and each strand of the web was as thick as a rope. The weavers huge. With his Witcher senses activated, Roy saw a pair of colorful ribbons hanging in the air, passing through the cobweb. One of those ribbons spoke of the scent of a human, while the other was of something else. Something that smelled of blood, hurt, injured, and it smells like a bug. Weak scent, though. With ease, the Witcher cut through the cobwebs and gesticulated in the air. Yet another illusion of him leapt into existence. It took the hand crossbow and followed Roy's hellhound as it charged into the cobweb-infested chamber. A thick, rope-like strand of spider silk cascaded into the hall, and a furry spider the size of a buffalo slid down its silk. The spider was grayish-white, with eight legs spread about it, supporting its gigantic body. The spider held up its two front legs, swinging them around like a grim reaper wielding its scythe. 
There was a maw attached to its head, and a pair of pincer-like fangs, bigger than its head, jutted out at the maw's end, clasping together like someone snipping a pair of scissors. Frostbite spider. Gender male. Age 12 years old. HP 210. Strength 15. Dexterity 17. Constitution 21. Perception 12. Will 7. Charisma. 3 spirit. 5 skills. Poison. Web level 5. Shoots out a ball of web at a target. The web is resilient, sticky, and hard to destroy. Contains paralyzing poison that activates on skin contact. Curse of the Frozen passive gains an increased 50% resistance to deep cold and ice magic, but takes 50% increased damage from fire attacks. The spider hurtled down toward the petite hellhound, but the creature deftly leapt to the side and evaded the attack. But the spider was not done. It shot out a ball of white goo at the hellhound, and the goo exploded like a little bomb. The web rained down on the hellhound, wrapping it up tightly like a cocoon. Before the spider could do anything, Illusion Roy fired off a bolt straight at the weaver's abdomen. An explosion of blood splattered the ground, and it staggered to the side. While the monster was distracted, the hellhound burned the web off with a stream of fire. The creature regained its freedom, but now its skin shone an eerie green, the green of poison. The hellhound did not have much longer to exist. A guttural growl escaped its snout, and with the last of its strength the hound pounced onto the spider's head. It clawed and chomped away, drawing blood with every strike, splattering the walls and ground with smatterings of the spider's blood. The spider let out an ear-piercing shriek and quickly climbed up its silk. The hellhound was crushed against the ceiling, leaving only a patch of blood behind. Once again, it returned to oblivion. Illusion Roy fired two more bolts, both slamming against the ugly head of that spider. The monster fell, howling in pain, but it quickly bent its legs and pounced at Illusion Roy, trying to destroy it with all the strength it could muster. But then another blue ball of light illuminated the air. Then, a second hellhound was summoned, and right away, it shot a ball of fire at the pouncing spider. At the same time, Eroy finally made his move. Quickly, he made complex gestures, and a crimson rune bloomed like a rose. The flames of fury burned across the air and crashed into the spider's abdomen once more. And the spider's belly splattered. It splattered into tiny little pieces like an exploding watermelon. Except the things that rained down were no rind or melon. They were instead the innards and blood of the spider. Even with half its body blasted to bits, the spider still lived, but not for long. Roy's flame slithered up to its head, and the spider, in its death throes, tried to move away, but it was for naught. Barely a moment later, it fell motionless. Yet the flames burned on. Frostbite spider killed, EXP plus 200, level 12 witcher, 4300 2500. Roy whistled, and his hellhound, covered in green, quickly approached him and rolled around like a good little pup. The witcher gave it some belly rubs to reward its performance. Then he cocked his eyebrow. Help! Save me, please! Let me out of here! Please! A desperate shout for help arose from the corner of the chamber. Flynn approached the source of the cry, while Roy quickly cut off a bulging venom sack and harvested a white spherical item that resembled a mutagen before reconvening with the dragonborn. Like most of the room, this corner was covered in cobwebs of the dead spider. But within these cobwebs lay a gaunt-looking man. Aside from his face, every inch of his body was wrapped up in the spider web, and not a finger of his could be moved. The sight of these newcomers delighted him, but then he froze. One of them. One of these adventurers looked different. His eyes were multicolored, and he possessed better looks than most, if not all beings he had seen. And he was staring at the man weirdly. The man had a feeling he was being stared at like he was prey. The thought of that alone sent a cold shudder down his spine. Chapter 473, Word Wall The adventurers met the stranger's eyes, the light of curiosity and doubt flickering in the former's gaze, while worry and panic flared in the latter's. Please, let me out. I can help you with the temple. Even open that door for you, Arvel begged like a poor little peasant. His whole face was almost scrunched up, as if he was trying his best to put on the act of a pitiable, ensnared man. Yet the strange man with a horned helmet shook his head and spoke in a language only he knew. If I save you, you'll be my servant until I leave this world. No headshakes? Good. 
that's a yes. What are you talking about? Who are you? Why did you come to this place? And how did that spider catch you? Flynn had his arms crossed, and he stared suspiciously at the stranger. He had a mousy face, jutting cheekbones, and a little mustache. How in Tamriel did this? Strange man get past all those bandits and draugers? Please let me out. I, I can't breathe. S suffocating. Please. And his voice came to an abrupt halt. Arvel felt the strange man's hand laying atop his head as he closed in. The master thief could see the witcher's eyes, eyes of gold and silver gleaming bright. As if electrocuted, Arvel stiffened up. Even his breathing stopped for a moment. A looming silhouette overwhelmed his mind, looking down at him as if he were nothing but a maggot. The silhouette looked just like a god. There was nothing in this mormit's eyes, no sympathy nor scorn. There was only indifference, and a message. Submit. Open your heart to me. Do not resist. Crimson tentacles swayed and danced behind that silhouette, not unlike bloody boa constrictors eager to wrap him up like the prey he was. Arvel could see the sharp teeth gnashing in the suckers of the tentacles, and they were spreading fear and darkness. One glance at the horrifying creature, and Arvel felt his blood run cold. Suffocating him was the stench of blood arising from the abyssal crimson sea underneath him, and in his mind the same message played. Submit. Arvel never stood a chance. Roy possessed a far stronger will than the master thief could ever imagine. Any resistance Arvel tried to muster was crushed, if there was even any resistance in the first place. The internal battle was, naturally, invisible to the dragonborn. All he saw was his companion holding the head of this ensnared stranger, and the stranger spaced out all of a sudden. Then he started convulsing, the look of fear etching itself deep in the stranger's eyes. Veins on his neck and temples popped, and his breathing labored. Flynn thought the stranger must have seen the darkest horrors, and he gulped. What's Goldeneye doing? Is he, is he reading the stranger's mind? But I thought that spell was lost. It was but an instant, but for Arvel, the horrors he saw seemed to last an eternity. Roy finally let go of the thief and began cutting the cobwebs open. All of a sudden, the sweat-drenched stranger fell limp, free of the bindings that trapped him in this chamber. The stranger rubbed his wrists and ankles, checking himself to see if he was fine. Then he heaved a sigh of relief. When the stranger turned his attention to the Witcher again, there was respect and fear in his eyes, the same kind of fear a servant would have for their master. Hunching his back a little, the stranger quietly stood beside the Witcher. He then cleared his throat and launched into a little introduction. Thank you for the save. I am Arvel the Swift, but you can call me Arvel. I'm a solo adventurer who's always on the hunt for treasure. T'was an ancient book that told me of this here temple, and so, my companions and I snuck in. You might ask how I managed to give the monsters a slip. Not to brag, but once I go into my stealth mode, barely anything can detect my presence. Eagles, hunting dogs, bats, you name it. But well, mistakes happen, and that blasted spider ensnared me in its web, and the rest is history. Flynn narrowed his eyes in suspicion. You're awfully cooperative all of a sudden. Roy telepathically told Arvel what Smallwer say, and the thief answered, Well, you saved my life, and I always repay my debts, so now I shall work with you and crack the mystery of this temple. At the same time, Arvel was answering the Dragonborn's question. He was quietly translating what the Dragonborn told him in his mind. All for his master, of course. A strange feeling welled within Roy. He had a feeling Arvel could never disobey him. If Roy wanted him to take his own life, the master thief would do it without any question. If he tried to resist, his soul would be destroyed by the crimson will residing within Roy. Tame was an unfair ability if used right. The ability to control the life of anyone was powerful, yet Roy would never try to control anyone if he could. He preferred a partnership, like the one he shared with Griffin back home. Arvel age, 35 years old, status, Thief HP, 80 Strength, 6 Dexterity, 8 Constitution, 8 Perception, 8 Will, 6 Charisma, 4 Spirit, 5 Skills, War Cry, Frost Resistance, Basic Sword Play, Level 5, Basic Archery, Level 4, Blessing of the Stars, The Thief, Horseback Riding, Level 5, Stealth, Level 4. This ability allows the user to quieten their movements and steer clear of enemy sights. High Level Stealth allows the user to blend into their surroundings. Some can even stand right in front of their enemies and remain undetected. 
Lockpicking Level 4 A master lockpicker can pick even the most intricate of locks with nothing but a set of lockpicks. A wise choice. We're here for a dragonstone. Know where it is? I reckon it's behind that golden claw gate along with the power of the ancient Nordlings. Arvel took a torch and burned away the cobweb before him. He bent down and advanced into the next chamber. A similarly claustrophobic chamber with barely any lighting. What kind of power? Flynn quickly followed after the thief. Arvel asked for Roy's permission to answer that question. Once his master gave his blessing, Arvel explained, the power the heroes use to defeat the dragons. They've defeated dragons? Flynn shook his head in disbelief. That's a joke. Have you ever even seen a dragon? They're as big as mountains, and their hides are tougher than granite. Nothing can pierce them, and they can breathe fire, turns their enemies to ash like nothing. He can, can even summon a hail of meteors, too. We saw that not too long ago, and Helgen's already a town of flames now. And now you're telling me these ancient Nordlings defeated a monster like that? That's just a legend. Despite all his denial, a voice in the Dragonborn's head was confirming the thief's story, and it urged him to gain that power as if it was in a great hurry, as if that power was his birthright. Roy brushed his finger across his blade, injecting his mana into the rune of Conjure Familiar. Once again, another hellhound leapt out of the gateway and scouted ahead for the adventurers. The legends are no lies. Once we open that gate, we'll find all the answers we want, Arvel promised. And I have the key to unlocking it. From his knapsack, he whipped out a curio, golden and in the shape of a dragon claw. Then he handed the claw to Goldeneye, much to Flynn's surprise. Everyone loves Goldeneye, I see. Dang. I hoped he'd have given that to me. Roy caressed the claw and turned it around. There on the claw were engravings of animals. From bottom to top, they were a bear, a moth, and an owl. The sight of these engravings reminded him of the lever puzzle. Wonder if this is a clue to another puzzle. Where did you find this? It's not my proudest moment, but I stole it from Riverwood's general store's keeper. Just a habit I picked up from my job. With the thief by their side, the adventurers found their journey to be far smoother. The draugers were remarkably powerful and were immune to pain. Those that wielded two-handed weapons were especially threatening. One clean hit was enough to send shudders down their enemies' spines, and these draugers still possessed the same level of skill they did in life. If Roy were to face these creatures, as in close combat, he would very quickly find himself in trouble. Alas, despite their numbers, these creatures were moving too slowly to even threaten the Witcher and his companions. The five of them, two familiars included, easily overwhelmed the Draugers. Illusion Roy would fire off at the Draugers, while the real Roy stood before the entrance of a passage, cutting down the oncoming monsters with his energy slash. Arvel and the Dragonborn took up the position of rearguard, picking off any enemies that Roy might have missed. Despite his profession, the thief was a better swordmaster than both Roy and Flynn. The Draugers rained down a barrage of attacks at the thief, and yet he managed to escape them all, although barely. Then he would go on the offensive, exploiting the openings of the Draugers after their assault as he thrust his blade into their necks and eyes, claiming their lives in a single blow. Flynn had picked up a shield somewhere. With a blade and his new protective gear in hand, the Dragonborn held his own, suffering barely any injuries. Two hours and a few dozen Draugers later, the adventurers finally came to the gate, hardly a scratch on them. The gate was gleaming golden, but it was sealed. Intricate patterns slithered all over it like vines climbing around a tree. In the center of the gate were three small holes, perfectly aligning with the golden claw. The claw was the key, but that alone wasn't enough. Three stone wheels were attached to the gate each with animals engraved on them. The adventurers must find the correct combination of animals, and only then would the key unlock this gate. So all we have to do is spin these wheels so the patterns align with the ones on the claw? Flynn asked. The answer's right here. Why'd they go to this much trouble making a puzzle if they're just gonna hand us the answer right away? They might as well ditch the whole thing. True, Arvel said, and the lever puzzle's really simple, don't you think? Anyone could have solved it. All they have to do is look. Well, anyone but idiots, really. Flynn blushed and argued. No, 
that lever puzzle is a lot harder than this one. This puzzle isn't some kind of lock. Roy thought he figured something out and Arvel translated his thoughts for the Dragonborn. It's just something to confirm that those who stand before this gate are still alive. Only the living can easily crack these puzzles. The dead? Well, you've seen the Draugrs. They're no different from idiots. Arvel was surprised, but he thought Roy had a point. So this puzzle is just a little something to keep the Draugrs out? Well, whatever the reason, the treasure is ours now. Ready, you two? Dust rained down as the gate yawned open for the adventurers. Behind the gate stood a spacious chamber, and at its end was a stone wall filled with markings that resembled claw marks and lightning bolts. In front of that wall slept a black sarcophagus. An excited Flynn was about to approach the wall, but Roy held his shoulder. He cast Clamp once more and summoned his clone. Armed with a hand crossbow and Dragon's Dream, the clone approached the sarcophagus, and a hellhound followed suit. A few moments later, the clone opened up the sarcophagus as ordered. Within the sarcophagus slept a draugr. An axe and a shield were lying atop the monster's chest, and the light of magic swirled around them. Noticing the disturbance, the monster opened its eyes. Like all draugrs met by the adventurers thus far, it had icy blue eyes. It growled like an enraged beast and held the sides of its sarcophagus as it slowly sat up. But before it could even do anything, the clone shattered its tomb. The tendrils of smoke within slithered around the corpse, and the clone darted back. At the same time, the hellhound spat a blast of flames at the corpse, igniting it. A pillar of fire roared into the air, rumbling the chamber. Stalactites rained down like pellets of hail, and miniature mushroom clouds sparked and shone. The clone fired two bolts into the cloud of flames, and blood burst ints o' oh, the air. The bolt's impact staggered the draugr, forcing it to take a few steps back. A furious roar escaped its throat, and it held up its shield. Without fear, it stepped through the wall of flames, gleaming crimson like a demon from hell. With a single strike from its axe, the clone was vanquished, but the witcher quickly cast another clamp. Another clone leapt into existence and did battle with the Draugr overlord. The Witcher tossed a fireball and a bolt of electricity at the same time. The spells hit the Draugr overlord squarely in the chest, slamming it sideways. The bolt of electricity slithered into the monster's armor, electrocuting it for a moment. For a split second, it froze, and the clone and hellhound regrouped with Roy right away. The trio formed a triangle and barraged the monster with a flood of attacks. Flynn watched in awe as his companions fired off simultaneous lightning bolts, fireballs, and crossbow bolts at the Draugr Overlord. Draugr Overlord, huh? More than 20 points in strength and nearly 30 points in constitution. Max level in one-handed axe mastery, but it's slow. If it can't get near us, it can't do any damage. The battle lasted for a mere 15 seconds. For a moment before the Overlord's death, it stood tall within the wall of flames, its eyes going wide. The monster held its weapons by its side and took one deep breath. And then it charged, bellowing to the heavens. Roy thought he heard something strange echoing through the air. It felt like something was burning that very air, creating a current. Fuss! And then everything around Roy seemed to change. The roar he heard contained enough power to smash boulders and tear through the heavens, even the earth rumbled, heralding the coming of an immense force. The force turned into a gale of air that could tumble anything and anyone that stood in its way. And the clone was the first to be hit. It was sent into the air and torn apart by the power contained within that shout. Roy quickly snapped out of it and fired off two bolts at his target. That, finally, was the straw that broke the camel's back. With the flames in its eyes extinguished, the Draugr Overlord finally fell. Draugr Overlord killed, EXP plus 260, level 12 Witcher, 5400 slash 2500. Even in death, the Draugr Overlord held onto its axe and shield tightly, never to let them go. Crisis averted. Arvel gave his master a look of deep respect. Let's go, people. Time to collect our earnings. Hold up. Did you hearth that shout just now? Flynn approached the wall, his cheeks tinted with a hue of crimson that almost looked sickly and he felt his heart thumping with such force, it was almost deafening. Such power. I remember that shout. The dragon in Helgen produced the same sound.
the adventurers found their dragon stone lying near the sarcophagus. It was the shape of a hand, and an intricate map was engraved upon it. Lying idly nearby was about a hundred coins and another lesser soul gem. There was also a one-handed axe with a hilt wrapped in leather, making it easy to hold. Ancient Nordling honed war axe of cold type, one-handed axe. Components, steel ingot, leather, logwood, soul gem. Specs, weighs 2.06 pounds, hilt measures 20 inches. Affix, frostbite, target takes a minor amount of cold damage. Target has reduced reaction and movement speed. A delighted Roy thought, wonder if I can upgrade my weapons with this. He tucked the war axe into his inventory space and looked at Flynn. The dragonborn was standing before the stone wall, staring dumbly at the writing upon it. The stone wall was reacting to his presence, strongly. Runes shone as brightly as the sun and flew off the wall. In the air they danced and swirled before they swam into the dragonborn's body. There was a solemn and determined look on Flynn's face. A frown creased his forehead as he concentrated on something. Something holy. Something only he could hear. What's happening to him? The witcher turned his sights to the wall and cast observe, but he received a message instead. Your observe does not meet the requirement needed to view this information. Nida 1 skill point, observe level 2, level 3. Right after Roy leveled up, his character sheet was flooded with new information. You have observed a special word wall. In it records a tonal magic by the name of unrelenting force, force fuss. You are not a dragon, nor are you a dragonborn. You are unable to understand dragon tongue, but your soul is powerful enough to learn this magic. Your elder blood, the blood of space-time, shares some similarities with the bloodline of dragons, the shards of time. You may attempt to observe the word wall and how the dragonborn absorbs the word of power by spending 2,000 pure souls, EXP. You may memorize the word of power and understand unrelenting force this way. Chapter 474, Wager at the Bannered Mare. 2,000, huh? Not even half the EXP I have. All right, I'll go with it. Level 12 Witcher, 5,400, 34,000, 2,500. Another wave of magical information flooded the witcher's mind. Thuum is a kind of magic known only to dragonkind. Through the resonance between their language and the earth, they can summon the strength of the bones of the earth, remnants of the Allmaker, and call forth incredible power to aid them in battle. Most people are only granted access to this power through years of rigorous training. Through meditation, they ameliorate their souls, pulling them closer to the power of dragons for a short while. They are then granted access to the power of the bones of the earth. But these people, though trained and experienced, do not possess the soul of a dragon. Learning through them will be excruciatingly difficult for them. They can and will go their whole lives mastering only the simplest of Thuum. Unrelenting force is the most basic of shouts. It has three words of power. You have gained fuss from the word wall, you have listened to Alduin utter Ro and Da in the destroyed town of Helgen. These words mean force, balance, and push, respectively. Together, they can push anything and anyone that stands in your path. To enhance your soul, you must meditate like this. To activate shout, you must do this. N.A., Golden Eye, are you all right? A shout snapped Roy out of his stupor, though his mind was still buzzing from the influx of information. Nervously, Flynn asked, did you see anything? Arvel translated the Dragonborn's question to Roy. The Witcher gave Flynn a weird look and nodded. I knew I wasn't the only one who saw those runes. Flynn heaved a sigh of relief and smiled. These words, they're the power that Draugr was guarding. Dragon magic. Thuum? Shouts, so to speak. I remember that dragon back in Helgen shouting something like this. The Dragonborn cleared his throat and roared, Fusro da! Nothing happened. Nothing but a gust of breeze brushed across the cheeks of the adventurers. I think I'm missing something. Can't use the shout. Flynn rubbed his temples awkwardly. The influx of new information was making his head buzz too. And I just learned a lot of new stuff. Need some time to get through everything. And then the witcher tried to do the same shout as well. Fuss Roda, but nothing happened. Neither the earth nor space moved for him. His soul was yet to be enhanced. At this point, even Ard packed a bigger punch than this shout did. I, I don't get it. Arvel approached the word wall and touched the runes softly. There was a look of surprise and bewilderment on his face. 
How come I'm the only one who didn't see a thing? You're telling me these unintelligible runes contain the power to fell a dragon? You know, that's an excellent question. I'd like to know the answer myself. Roy heaved a sigh. I spent 2,000 EXP, and I barely managed to understand it. Still a long way off from mastering it. How on earth can this power defeat a dragon? And how did Flynn learn the shout without any guidance? Because he's a dragonborn? He's some sort of descendant of a dragon? The runes did shine and swim into his body. Roy had another guess. Maybe he's related to the dragons, or maybe he's born with their power sleeping within him. Dragonborn shouts. Thuum Roy telepathically asked Arvel, Hey, you're an adventurer, aren't you? Been to a lot of ruins and tombs? Ever heard of the words Dragonborn and Thuum? A frown furrowed Arvel's forehead as he tried to remember those words. It's an ancient legend. Thousands of years ago, dragons were alive and active in Tamriel. The dragonborns would slay them and take their power for themselves. And then the thief smacked the back of his head, a stroke of inspiration striking him. Oh, right. That shout that destroyed your conjuration? The one that Draugr used? It's called Thuum. This is just a rumor, but only dragonborns can master Thuum. Roy shot Flynn a look of surprise, and the dragonborn got a little nervous. So he's a slayer of dragons and the heir of Thuum. He's practically a legend. Maybe I'll need him to get my hands on some dragon blood. The thief looked at his companions and was about to say something, but Roy told him to keep quiet. They then looted the chamber and came across some locked chests. The witcher was about to cut them open with his blade, but his servant stopped him. According to him, some chests would destroy their contents if their lock was forcibly destroyed. He took over and picked the lock of the chests, easily unlocking them. The chests netted our adventurers about a hundred coins and a lesser soul gem. The coins were split between Arvel and Flynn, while Roy took the soul gem. And now I have three lesser soul gems. I'll keep some for myself. Four hundred coins. Should be enough to buy something from Ferengar. They exited through the chamber's right door and returned to the hill outside. Dawn just broke through the horizon and a gust of breeze sauntered through the air. It reinvigorated the adventurers. One whole day and night had gone by since they entered the temple. We got the stone. Time to go back to Ferengar. Flynn took a deep breath and grinned. This is goodbye, Arvel. Arvel held the sword on his girdle and looked at Roy with respect. I don't have anything to do, so why don't I come with you guys? Flynn's smile disappeared, and he exchanged a look with his companion. The Witcher pretended to give it a thought, then he nodded. Let's go. We digit through a whole dungeon together. This calls for a drink. Once again, the adventurers, this time with Arvel by their side, returned to the antechamber in Dragon's Reach. I can see why you survived the attack. Efficient. It's only been a day, and you've already gotten the stone. Oh, and thanks for your help, Arvel. Ferengar observed the intricately engraved stone. I shall inform the Jarl of your deed. As promised, you shall have the right to own a house in Whiterun. But beware, houses do not come cheap in this city. Oh, and one more thing. Goldeneye, I've assessed the soul gem you sold me, and it is no lesser soul gem. It's a black soul gem, one that can be used repeatedly. It's worth 600 gold, so I still owe you 500. Here. The mage handed Roy a purse of coins. Arvel translated Roy's thoughts. Ferengar, what does this stone do anyway? And how do you intend to fight the dragons with it? Alas, I have no answer for that just yet. All the more reason to find its secrets as soon as possible. My associate is on their way. What about the draugers, then? They just came back to life all of a sudden, Flynn asked curiously. Back when they had returned to Whiterun, he had heard that strange summon once more. It came from the looming peak standing in the southeastern direction. Ah, about that. Farangar organized his words and answered, I do not know the details, but in a time long past, there existed a dragon-worshipping cult. They call themselves the Dragon Cult, and they ruled Skyrim. Tamriel was a world where the strong ruled over the weak. The weak among humanity loved to worship those stronger than them. But the dragons, in all their cruelty, claimed the lives of countless innocents. Their heinous acts sparked a rebellion among humans. And then, the dragonborn among the Nordlings led their brethren in a valiant battle. They exiled almost all dragons from Skyrim. But before the dragons met their extinction, 
the priests of Dragon Cult mummified a great deal of their cultists, binding their souls within their mortal shells and connecting them to the object of their faith, dragons. Their creed states that these slumbering cultists will return to life as draugers when the dragons make their return, and Helgen's destruction heralds the coming of the dragons. Oh, so that's how it is. Roy and Flynn finally pieced the puzzle together. So that's why Alduin showed up. That's why the draugers came back to life. So who was that draugr overlord anyway? I am not too sure. Needs more investigate, Ion. Ferengar shook his head. And now, I believe you need some rest. I suggest you have a drink or two at the Bannered Mare, rent some rooms, take a nice hot bath, and find yourselves some women. Just relax for a few days before you come back. The Bannered Mare was an inn in the Plains district of Whiterun. Like most structures in Whiterun, it looked rough around the edges. A bonfire crackled in the center of the establishment, and the ivory candelabra hanging from the ceiling swayed. Roy stood before the counter, his eyes scanning over the establishment. Men and women of Whiterun sat around the bonfire. Some had capes, some had old, sturdy leather armor, and all were here for booze. Nordlings were born fighters. Even the patrons of the Bannered Mare had a combat skill or two, and their stats averaged a respectable seven. That was a lot higher than the civilians of the Witcher world. Some were on the floor, some leaned on the wooden pillar supporting the ceiling, while some sat in a half-circle, raising toasts to their companions. Foams of beer lathered the beards of the male patrons and fell to the ground. A sweet scent of alcoholic nectar wafted in the air of the inn, intoxicating the patrons. The few ladies in the inn swayed along to the singing of Mikhail, the in-house bard. He was performing a tune by the name of Age of Aggression, and true to the name, the ladies swayed violently, as if they were trying to vent something. Roy noticed the instrument held by the bard. It looked just like the lute back home. Ah, art transcends time and space. Ah, that hit the spot. Flynn took a big swig of the amber-colored liquid in his mug, and looked away from the chest of the well-proportioned innkeep. His face was flush, and his mind, which was filled to the brim with dragon tongue, finally calmed a little. Once again, the dragonborn could play around, and he spoke earnestly to his friend. Goldeneye, we've escaped a dragon's wrath, went through a deadly temple, and killed a powerful draugr. That makes us comrades, but still, I know nothing about you. Well, aside from the fact that you're a skilled adventurer, I know nothing. I don't even know where your home is. Flynn stared at his friend, and Roy murmured something. Arvel took his hat off to wipe the sweat off his face. He says he's from a place beyond Tamriel. And how do you know that? I have a talent for languages, believe it or not. I can guess what he's talking about, and we did talk about his home before. Roy nodded. Flynn's eyes widened in surprise. Hey, but I'm supposed to be Goldeneye's first friend. How come this thief knows him better? He looked disgruntled. So where's his home, if not Tamriel? Arcadia? Or is it Yokuda, home of the Red Guards? Neither. He comes from, um, a place called Novigrad. Arvel too looked surprised hearing that name. It's an even more bustling place than Whiterun. They have a big port there, and dozens of ships would come to trade every day. I knew it. He's no peasant from any old hamlet. So what did he used to do? Can you ask him? Arvel gulped down the piece of grilled potato he was eating. He used to be a mercenary, made a living by taking requests, monster hunting and puzzle solving. Oh, and he, he used to run an orphanage, but then tragedy struck. Other mercenaries attacked him during one particular request, and he was exiled to Skyrim, a long way away from Novigrad. He doesn't even know if he can go home. Oh, sorry, Goldeneye. Didn't know you had a rough ride, Flynn sighed. But an orphanage? Wow. I'd be thanking the gods if I could make enough just to support myself and my family. Oh, you're an orphan? asked Arvel. Flynn took another swig of his beer. I was born in Cyrodiil, the center of the empire located south of Skyrim. After my parents' passing, I came to Skyrim, to where my home is. I am a Nordling, after all. Been four years since then, yet I still have nothing under my name, just a lowly tramp. But then the soldiers came for me, thinking I was a rebel. A smile curled the dragonborn's lips. But I suppose I should thank them. Without them, I would never have run into Goldeneye, would never have embarked on this adventure. Here, a toast to the Imperials. They clanged their bottles together, and foam sprayed everywhere. 
Then the adventurers gulped down their booze. Flynn wiped the beer off his mouth. Why did you go, go to the temple? You're a decent fighter, but trying to go through that place all by yourself would be a suicide mission. I didn't go in there alone. The droggers and bandits killed my companions. Arvel touched his mustache, his eyes filled with melancholy. And I have a reason to venture into that temple. I promised I'd get my hands on the strength that can fell dragons and prove myself to her, but now I see I'm not cut out for that job. You two got something from that wall, but I didn't. I don't think I can ever master a shout. Roy heaved a sigh. He would like to help, but not even he managed to master a shout. Flynn might be a dragonborn, but he too needed time to go through all the information in his head, even if he did absorb everything in one go. And then a hardened, furry hand slammed itself on the adventurer's table. The man behind that hand had the hard look typical of Nordlings. His beard was braided, and his blonde hair was tied back. With a roaring voice, he asked, Did you just raise a toast to the Imperials? You an Imperial supporter? He wobbled and swayed drunkenly. Enough, John Battleborn. You're drunk. Lie down somewhere and lay your hands off my customers. Hulda, the innkeep, put her hands on her hips and shot John a withering look over the counter. Just a few questions for our friends, Hulda. We're not Imperial supporters. Flynn wiped the drool off his face and shot John an icy look. So that means you're with the Rebellion. John tensed up and snarled at the adventurers, shoving Flynn's chest with an empty bottle. I see you dislike the rebels as well. We do not acknowledge their actions either. We're not supporters of either faction, Arvel translated Roy's thoughts. Though he too had the same thought. He was no Nordling. If possible, he would stay away from this civil war. If anything, he despised Thalmor the most. They were the ones who incited this war. Yes, we take no sides in this war. Flynn stood up. We share the Jarl Balgruf's opinion. What will you do now? Force us to change our minds. John took a deep breath and shook his head. No, neutral's fine. He looked at the adventurers and, at long last, realized some of them were survivors of Helgen's dragon attack. You must be the survivors of the dragon attack on Helgen. Obviously, you've never heard of the Battleborns and their greatness. You show no respect to us, and I do not like that. Someone needs to teach you a lesson. I challenge you to a duel. By drinking. Are you challenging all of us at once? asked Arvel mischievously. If you feel no shame in using your numbers advantage, Nordlings, then I accept the challenge. John stood up straighter, glaring at the adventurers. Flynn was raring to go, but Arvel held him down. Fine. Our leader accepts your challenge. We just got back from an adventure. He wishes to wind down with a drink or two. Roy approached the drunken Nordling and smiled at him. I assume we'll have a prize for this contest, Battleborn. But of course, if I lose, I will do anything you ask of me, as long as it's within my power to do so. The Battleborns are famous in Whiterun, after all. But if this... Goldeneye were to lose, then he must show proper respect to the Battleborns every time he sees us, in the form of a proper bow. John swung his arm down. Drinks are on me, regardless of the outcome. Roy nodded quietly. And then, a young man with black hair and golden eyes sat down before the counter with a battle-hardened, burly man. Arvel folded his arms confidently, while the dragonborn stood behind him, looking a little nervous. A few of the tipsier patrons craned their necks to watch this little wager with interest. John nodded at the innkeep, and Hulda laid out a row of alcohol before the contestants. Alto wine, Nordling mead, ale, everything she had. But John sobered up for a moment and scoffed. Hulda, I can't believe you aren't serving up any brandy or black briar mead. This is an important contest. I have more than enough coins to pay for the best you have. Give us the Argonian ale. I don't have Argonian ale. Hulda crossed her arms and obviously lied. This is the best I have, you battle-crazed oaf. Fine, I guess we can work with these. John smirked at the witcher, and then, as if he was already victorious, he said, Don't push yourself, kid. If you do anything stupid when you're drunk, I'll whoop you into next week. Roy only smiled. I'm twice as sturdy as you are, and I have Activate to clear any debuffs. This is going to be easy. Hold on. A burp echoed across the air. A second, please. A husky voice spoke. Sam Gunven, wine connoisseur, you have an interesting contest going on here. Mind if I join? The newcomer was a tall, slender man with slicked back hair, 
He was in simple attire, not unlike those belonging to scholars or mages. The man let out a laugh, a nonchalant, flippant laugh. Let's see who's the best drinker. Last man standing gets an enchanted sword. Oh, you don't need to give me anything if I win. This is just for fun. He whipped out a gleaming sword. Then it had a cross-shaped crossguard and a ruby pommel. Its blade was as thin and supple as a moth's wing, its runes gleaming like stars under the candlelight. There was a name carved on the hilt, but before Roy could have a closer look, the mage clasped his hand, and the blade disappeared into thin air. That sword is wasted on a weakling like you. John looked at the frail mage and shook his head scornfully, then his eyes burned with desire. I'll happily take it off your hands. Challenge accepted. What about you, Goldeneye? Arvel translated the conversation for Roy. The Witcher looked at this newcomer and realized he, like Ferengar, was a mage, though Ferengar was a far more powerful mage than Sam was, a mage who's also an alcoholic. Odd, Roy nodded nonetheless. Happily, Sam took the seat on Roy's right side. He tapped his finger on the table, and Hulda served him a row of alcohol as well. Well, bottoms up, the mage picked up a bottle of ale and bellowed in laughter, signaling the start of this drinking contest. Chapter 475, Redmount An unconscious man stirred, his eyelashes fluttering. With difficulty, the man opened his eyes. He then pushed himself up, rotten leaves squelching underneath his hands. He looked around and found himself in a forest. Dappled sunlight shone through the leaves, and whispers of beasts and chirping of beetles came from the depths within the trees. At first, the man was confused, but then he was surprised. Where am I? What happened? Roy massaged his temples and freshened his groggy mind up. Then he stood, wobbly like a drunken man just waking up with a hangover. I remember the drinking contest back in the inn. So what's the deal with this forest? How did I get here? Roy turned his attention to the character sheet. He was now drunk. To his surprise, all his gear was still with him. Must be a prank. John and Sam must have dragged me all the way out here when I was drunk. Wait, that couldn't be. John fell after fifteen bottles. Sam and I were left. We went on and on and on. Roy could feel his belly filled to bursting point with alcohol, but not once did he use his inventory to cheat. He wished to vent all his frustration through the contest, though he did ask Arvel to keep an eye on him. Roy could hear the crackling of the inn's bonfire even though he was groggy. Just when he was about to fall unconscious, Sam succumbed before he could. He fell on the counter snoring away. And then the air was filled with cheers and applause from the Nordlings, then everything went black. It was dusk back when I was in the inn, and it's still dusk now. Was I out for a whole day? Roy tried to contact Arvel, but there was no response from his servant, nor could he teleport away. It felt like some strange power had locked this space he was in. A frown creased Roy's forehead, and a sense of unease took over him. Most people don't have this kind of power. Heck, most mages don't have this kind of power. He was suddenly reminded of that mage who joined their little contest back in the inn, the one with a nonchalant smile. And then, as if the witcher had pulled a trigger, he heard something speak. Find me, hold me, take me, find me, hold me, take me. Who is this Sam guy? He's more powerful than I thought. And why did he pull this prank on me? Just because I won that contest? Hmm, but he meant me no harm or he could have just killed me when I was drunk. So, why did he bring me here? Fine, if that's what you wish for, then that's what you get. Let's find out what you are. The bizarre, disembodied voice that echoed through the air did not scare the Witcher. He had seen many strange events in his life. Quickly, he composed himself and walked in the direction his heart was pointing him. Through the plains, the Witcher walked. Time and time again, he tried to teleport back to his servant, but alas, all his attempts ended in failure, and then he ran into a wooden fence. Roy walked through the fence and ran into a Nordling. Hello, friend. It's getting dark. What brings you here? A man in hunter attire with a bow strapped to his back greeted Roy. You shouldn't go around at night. The beasts will eat you. Roy scanned the man, a regular Nordling. Nothing special about him. Hey, wait a minute. At this point, the Witcher's mind had sobered up, and he realized something weird. Arvel's not here, so how did I manage to understand this guy? It was a situation Roy had never met before, and he took some time to process it, though he still had no answer to any question he had. 
and so he said, Sorry, buddy, I was looking for someone, but I got lost, and, well, tried to run around, but now the sun's setting. What is this place, anyway? There must be a reason why he left me here. Maybe this place holds some clues to his whereabouts. Red Mount. I'm looking for one Sam Govan. Have you seen him? The guard shook his head. No idea who that is, but maybe someone in the village does. He looked at Roy again and let out a hearty laugh. His beard trembled, and he warmly invited, It's getting dark, lad. Staying out alone is Dan. Jairus, why don't you come in and look around the village? Kelly's got some good ale. Maybe it'll jog your memory. Roy took a deep breath. Well, when in Rome, show me what you got, Sam. Appreciate the invitation, but spare the booze. The guard let his guard down, and then Roy quickly cast an axie. A shudder coursed through the guard's body, and his face blanked. Now he was as obedient as a puppet. Now let's start with an introduction. Roy gained nothing from the questioning. Five minutes later, the guard led him into the village, then he returned to his post. Roy looked up and saw a mountain standing behind the village. The village was surrounded by lush greenery. Houses made of mud, wood, and stones were strewn everywhere, and fields of bountiful crops stood at the sides of the village. A clear stream gurgled in the west side of the village, and a watermill turned round and round in the corner, stirring up a blanket of wet white fog. Goats stampeded and rampaged around the alleyways, while villagers strolled down the streets, languid smiles hanging from their lips. T'was a typical, peaceful village of farmers. On the east side of the village was a beach covered in golden sands, and a great ocean unfurled beyond it. Roy said hi to a villager. Oh, you must be an outsider. The man wore a friendly smile as he looked at Roy. Never seen you before. Yes, I'm from Whiterun. You ever heard of it? Roy was looking at the man closely, hoping he would have clues leading to the mage's location. Ah, it's in the far north, isn't it? The journey alone takes a month, and that's with a carriage. Heard it's a lot colder than Redmount. So what brings you here? Some sightseeing? Roy shook his head, smiling. I'm looking for one Sam Govan. Ever heard of him? I think I have. Oh, right. Sherry mentioned that name before. Who's Sherry? Oh, she's a wonderful girl. The village only got this good by virtue of her. Thanks to her, we're all living happy lives. She must have done a lot for the village then. Okay, this might be a clue. Yep. She's beautiful and kind. Ever since she found that mine in the woods, life has gotten a lot better for us. Everyone loves her. The man had a big grin on his face. He seemed to have nothing but love for the girl, and he kept on with his praise. And she knows a lot. You should go see her. Maybe she can help you. Just walk down this street until the very end. She's in the house right by the mountain. Knock on the door before you go in. She lives with her mother, Caroline. The lady's as kind as her daughter. Roy rubbed his chin. Hmm, warmly, the man continued. Or you can try your luck at Firefalls Inn. The innkeep probably knows what you're looking for. She knows a lot of stuff, too. Eleventh house down this street. If you need supplies, you can find Balrog's general goods store in rural Redmount, or you can buy some stuff from Tharkin in the marketplace. Have a nice stay. We don't get a lot of visitors here in Redmount. Thanks for your help. Roy nodded and slowly walked down the street. He was in no hurry. Like a tourist, he looked around the village, soaking in its scenery. Smoke billowed from the chimneys of Redmount's houses, glimmering under the sun like stars shining in an ethereal river. The villagers here didn't seem to close their doors. Roy could see the cauldrons bubbling over the fire pits within these houses. The scent of meat and fruits wafted through the air, tempting those who took a whiff to sit down and have a meal. Some of the ladies waved at the witcher and invited him in to dine. Roy rubbed his belly, still filled with wine, and shook his head. As he walked down the street, a few more villagers smiled at him. He asked them a few more questions, and the villagers, driven by their curiosity, patiently answered the witcher's questions. Though they either had no idea who Sam was, or they told him he should talk to Sherry about it. Eventually, he came to the end of the street, and here, a short little house stood. In the yard was a black-haired woman, in a red apron swinging her axe away at the firewood. She looked to be in her thirties, beautiful face, rosy cheeks, and a plump body, Beads of sweat hung from her chin, dazzling like a drop of liquid rainbow gleaming under the sun. 
Ahem, might this be Sherry's home? Yes, and who might you be? I don't remember seeing you in the village. The woman put down her firewood and held her axe with one hand as she wiped away sweat with the other. How may I help you? She smiled. Hi, I'm a traveler from Whiterun. You can call me Goldeneye. I'm here for a girl named Sherry. Let me guess, you're her mother, Caroline. Roy looked at her hand. An ugly scar stretched across the back of her hand. Wonder if that's from all her lumberjack work. The woman nodded. Yes, but why do you ask? How do you know of her? The villagers told me she might be able to help me. I'm looking for one Sam Guven. It's urgent. I see. Well, you are a guest. Caroline smiled gently. Her room's on the left, right, after you go in. She's practicing her dance, and you might be the perfect audience for her. Go. Are you sure you want me to watch your daughter dance, ma'am? I'm a guy. Why not? You seem like a decent lad. Caroline beamed. You won't hurt her, will you? Sherry's room was hidden behind a reddish-brown curtain. It was a simple, clean, and neat room illuminated by candlelight. On the left side was a pink bed standing close to the wall with a doll in a red dress lying quietly by the pillow. On the right was a bookshelf filled with romance novels and poetry. In the center of the room was a girl in a yellow dress. She stood up straight, pirouetting like a top. Her left foot, covered in a shoe, rested against her right knee. She held her hands up and spun along with the rhythm, just like a dancing swan. Her skin was as white as snow and as smooth as silk. Her beautiful, lustrous hair was tied up in a ponytail, gleaming under the candlelight. She had a petite face and a pair of eyes the color of bright emerald. Her eyelashes were long and her nose aquiline, her lips were as soft as flower petals, and her ears were hidden beneath her hair. The girl looked sweet and slender in form, and young. She was only tall enough to reach Roy's chin. Like a blooming flower, she seemed fresh and full of life. Sherry age, 13 years old. Status, Redmount Villager. After three more spins, the girl finally stopped and opened her eyes, surprised to find a stranger in her room. Who are you? And then a hint of delight filled her eyes. Oh, a visitor? Yes, and you must be Sherry. Call me Goldeneye. The villagers told me you know a lot, and your mother told me I could come in. Roy turned his sight away. The last lady to impress him this much just with her looks alone was Vivienne, a girl this beautiful, living in a village like this. I can see why she's loved by the villagers. You're a great dancer, Sherry, especially for someone your age, Roy praised. I need her help, so gotta make her happy. Really? The girl stared at the witcher with anticipation twinkling in her eyes. She held her beautiful hands before her chest, and excitement welled on her face. I've been dancing for a long time now. I love to dance. She had a voice as warm and soothing as a spring breeze. Roy felt his heart melt just listening to her speak. It's an art of expression, an expression of your feelings through movement. I, I feel happy when I dance. Good opinion. You'd be a marvelous dancer if you could perform in the city. Why didn't you dance on the streets anymore? I'm sure everyone would love to watch you dance, Roy said. They love you. Oh, I've danced plenty. They're bored of it now. I need to come up with some new moves. I need inspiration. And then she hung her head low like a despondent little cat abandoned by her friend. Oh, and you are. Goldeneye. So why did you come? I know it's not just because of my dancing, she asked cutely. This might sound strange, but I'm looking for someone named Sam Guven. He tossed me into this queue. Ain't little village, answered Roy. I wish to go home, and he's the key to it. I see. I think I know who you're talking about. Sherry stared at the ground again, musing over the matter. She looked a little reluctant at first, but then for some reason, perhaps because she was being helpful, she bit her lip and looked at the witcher. I can take you, Tim, but I have three favors to ask. The witcher hesitated. Should I just cast Axie on her and make her talk? But he couldn't. She was too sweet and frail. Even a battle-hardened witcher like Roy couldn't take advantage of her. But more importantly, this could be a test from Sam to see if he was worthy. Gotta be careful. Name them, but I make no guarantees. And three favors is a lot to ask. I can do one, so what do you say? Oh, they're simple favors. Help me, and I'll take you to him. They're really fun, so don't worry. Sherry stared at him again with anticipation in her eyes, her eyes glimmering like stars. So do we have a deal, Goldeneye? Can I call you Goldie? 
I've always wanted a brother, and that sounds like a brotherly name. Roy extended his hand and shook hers. Sherry beamed, and gorgeous dimples formed on her cheeks. Wait for me at the watermill to the northwest. I'll be there soon. Now? Roy frowned. It's a bit late, don't you think? Oh, we can make it. Chapter 476 Three Wishes In the northern area of Redmount stood one watermill, an ancient black watermill. It turned ever so slowly, stirring up water from the river and scattering it all across the air. The droplets of water glimmered like gold under the sun, and the gurgle of the river drowned out the sound of the gear turn. Roy was wading through the patch of dandelion, purslane, and foxtails beside the watermill, searching for something. For my first wish, I want to get six butterflies, three blues and three monarchs. Yeah, she's a child, all right, Roy shook his head. I can't believe I'm playing a child's game here. Me, a witcher. I didn't even do this back at the orphanage. Gods, if those guys find out, they're gonna laugh at me. But at least it's better than literal crimes, I guess. With his witcher senses activated, Roy stared right at the slender path hidden between the tall grass, searching for his quarry. He couldn't catch a butterfly if there were no butterflies to catch. A while had gone by since he started this little hunt, and yet there was not a single butterfly to be seen. Behind him, Sherry was waving her net around, happily pouncing at the butterflies fluttering within the grass and giggling in glee. Golden sunshine rained down upon her, draping her in a sheen of gold. Roy would look at her with admiration for a while, and then Sherry shouted, Golden Eye, there! She ran over to Roy, swinging her net around. The witcher set his senses to Sherry's vicinity and saw a yellow butterfly with black lines on its wings fluttering across a patch of thistle, a monarch butterfly. It leapt from one purple flower to the next, as if saying hello to them. Roy crouched among the grass like a cat ready to pounce at its prey, while Sherry stayed by his side, carefully standing on her tiptoes. Roy could feel her ponytail brushing against the nape of his neck, and he could smell the scent coming off her. Slowly, Roy moved closer to the monarch butterfly. When they were only a few inches away from the butterfly, the girl hopped ahead and swung her net down, but the butterfly flew away like it was blown by a gust of wind, easily evading the girl's net. The girl pouted, but then she saw another net zipping past her. It was so fast, she almost couldn't see it clearly. A moment later, Roy had already caught the butterfly, and he winked at her. Awesome, Goldie! Sherry spun around in delight and carefully tucked the butterfly into a cage she brought, and she beamed like a girl who had just gotten her favorite toy. So, shall we continue? Very well. Quite a while had gone by, but the sun was still shining in the sky, and the watermill turned on and on. Giggles and laughter echoed in the air, and then the witcher and the girl finally stopped their little game. They sat underneath the watermill, golden rays of sunset raining down on their shoulders. They swung their feet in the water, letting its cool waves lap away their exhaustion. Thank you, Goldie. It's been a while since I had this much fun. Beads of sweat trickled down her cheeks. She stared at the blues and monarchs in her cage, a big smile curling her lips, her eyes gleaming little stars. Look at them. They're beautiful. They are. Roy enjoyed the view. Fluttering butterflies, blooming flowers, a gurgling stream, and an adorable young lady having the time of her life. For a moment, he felt his soul settling, and he smiled. So why are you collecting these butterflies? Are you going to make them into specimens? Sherry shook her head. It's just for fun. Sherry kicked away at the water, her legs glimmering like beautiful pearls under the sunshine. It's been a long time since someone came with me on a butterfly hunt. Really? Roy doubted that. Caroline and the villagers seem to love you. I think they'll be happy to play with you. It's different, Sherry whispered. Then she smiled sweetly at Roy. Let's talk about the butterflies. We caught them together, Goldie. You can decide what happens to them. I see. Roy stared into Sherry's eyes, and he shook his head. I can go with anything. You decide. Sherry mused over her decision, and then she said loudly, Why don't we let them go, then? Butterflies are the best when they can fly around freely. Good idea. Sherry saw the butterflies off, and then she smiled mysteriously at Roy. There was a hint of a plea in her eyes, as if she was worried he might refuse her next request. As for my second wish, I want to play a game of hide-and-seek. You're it. 
I'll hide somewhere around the village. If you catch me, I'll give you a surprise. Roy looked at the setting sun and frowned in hesitation, but he nodded in the end. Let's do this. Face the banana tree and count to 100. Count loudly. I have to be able to hear it. Sherry huddled closer to the witcher and held his hands. Cutely, she said, no cheating. Cheaters get punished. She then stood behind Roy and blew at her bangs. I'm great at hiding. If you can't find me, you can always ask the villagers for clues. The village smiled upon the setting sun. A witcher stood on the village's streets, staring at the ground dumbly. Countless ribbons intertwined in the air, leading into the villagers' houses. But no matter how much he tried, he couldn't find the ribbon belonging to Sherry. Yet her scent still lingered around his nose. Even so, he could find no trace of Sherry. It felt like she had disappeared into thin air. Okay, this almost never happened. Weird. I can't cheat, so I'll have to find her manually. Wonder where she's hiding. He searched the village, but there was no sign of Sherry anywhere. In the end, he went to her house, but only Caroline was around. She's playing hide-and-seek? Caroline was in the kitchen. She pushed her bangs back and smiled. I see she has taken a liking to you. I think she feels lonely. Don't you guys play with her? Roy asked. He was still wondering why Sherry made those wishes. It felt like she wanted a playmate. Everyone loves her. They won't refuse her, will they? The villagers used to be harsh on her. Nobody would go near her except for me. Why? asked Roy. She's a beautiful and gentle soul. Why would the villagers hate her? And why did they start liking her? Our village used to be abysmally poor. That was the only thing everyone ever talked about. Caroline stopped talking for a moment, and she tensed up, but then she smiled. But one day, Sherry stumbled upon a silver mine when she was playing in the mountains, and things changed for the better. The villagers were starving no longer, and everyone started making money. They feel indebted to Sherry, so they started harboring affection for her. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then? First their physical needs are met, and then they can afford kindness. She knows everyone in the village now. Caroline smiled. Maybe she thinks you'll be a better playmate. Perhaps offer her a challenge. Do you know where she's hiding then? Roy whispered. He felt a little embarrassed. I'm an expert tracker. Can't believe I have to ask an average woman for help. Or her usual haunt? Try the beach. She loves to see the sunset alone. To the west of Redmount was a vast forest filled with lush greenery, a waterfall thundering down a cliff, and a watermill. On its right was a slope leading to the golden sands facing the vast, glimmering ocean. Beyond the horizon was the setting sun, saying its goodbye before passing the torch to the night. Dazzling colors swam and swirled in the skies and sea, and beside the waters, Roy saw an old man. He wore a straw hat and held a rod and an empty wooden bucket, his skin red from exposure to the elements. Ah, visitor. Here to find Sherry, I suppose? He grinned toothily at Roy, wrinkles scrunching up his face. Have you seen her? Is she hiding here? Oh, I can't break the rules. Sorry, visitor. The old man pinched his goatee. What will make you change your mind? I can give you a clue, but we'll have to make a deal. I make no guarantees. Just try your best, then. Fine. Roy heaved a sigh. He thought the villagers were a bit odd, though he felt no malice coming from them. Sherry had a bad past. She's keeping her feelings bottled up. The old man sighed. Try to cheer her up. Play along with her if you can. What kind of past? Roy asked. Can I have more details? The old man wouldn't tell him anything. You'll know, if she is willing to tell. So, do we have a deal? I will try my best, but I make no guarantees. The old man patted his hat and stayed quiet for a while. Fine. But remember, she likes poetry. If you can't find her, try reciting a poem or two. I see you, Sherry. Roy shouted into the air and quickly stepped on the sands, pacing back and forth, but he received no response no matter how long he shouted. Weird. Why isn't she taking the bait? She should have fallen for that easily. But no matter how long Roy searched, he couldn't find Sherry. Did they lie to me? Am I searching in the wrong direction? Gods, at this rate I'll have to go with that. Embarrassed, Roy paced around. Finally, he saw no way out, and he sighed. Not like anyone I know is here. I'll just take a leaf out of Dandelion's page. Let's name this poem, Sherry. I hope this'll work. Roy coughed and took a deep breath. He puffed his chest out and looked into the distance, where the ocean murmured.
Into the sand I tread, the village behind me, quaint and quiet, the setting sun waves, and beyond the sands I see Sherry coming to me, her hair golden as the sun, her lips red as a cherry, gently she goes through the sands to me she comes. The sound of Roy's recital echoed across the air. It wasn't professional, nor was it filled with too much emotion, but Roy made sure it was loud, and his voice echoed through the air. Her hair, golden as the sun, her lips, red as a cherry, gently she goes through the sands, to me she comes. Roy felt the sand beneath him shiver, and then a petite figure broke through the surface. It was Sherry, her face was red, and tears glistened in her eyes. The water in the sand drenched her dress, and now her dress clung tightly on her skin. Her shoulders trembled, and she started to cry. Sorry, Sherry, have you been waiting long? No, the girl wouldn't stop crying. I just never thought someone would write a poem for me. She stared at the witcher, moved. Thank you, Goldie. This is the happiest day of my life. Ah, and am I really that beautiful? She muttered, hair golden as the sun and lips red as cherries. Of course, you're the most beautiful girl in Redmount. Did I go too far? I probably shouldn't have learned from Dandelion, he said. Like everyone in the village, I adore you. Can I record that poem? Of course, it's yours. The girl stared down in excitement. A moment later, she stepped into the shallow seas and scooped up some water to wash the sands off her, and her skin seemed to glisten. Yet Roy had a feeling she looked lonely, like she never had someone in her life who cared for her before. Roy sighed. Wait, something's off. He turned around and saw a lot of villagers standing behind the fence beyond this beach. They were smiling at the both of them, not unlike parents seeing off their daughter before she got married. And yet, Roy couldn't shake the unease he was feeling. The smile, the glimmer in their eyes, their expressions. They all look the same. You've granted two of my three wishes. I'm really happy. I don't know how to thank you, Sherry spoke. But now it's time for my third wish. Please, come with me, to the ruins at the mountain's base. Chapter 477, Don't Leave Me Roy followed the girl back to the village. Surprisingly, she had a pair of steady feet, not unlike an experienced hunter, and yet her feet were perfect and flawless. They went through the patch of thistles on the west side of the village, passed through the ancient water mill, and crossed the gurgling stream. Eventually, they came to the base of a cliff where the ruins of a temple stood. Vines crawled upon the pillars and walls of the ruins, and the air was filled with a sense of desolation. No mortal soul was to be found here. The only residents were foxes, mice, and other critters. This was their home. And in the spot where the falls and ruins met, a black stone door stood. Sherry slowly opened the door, revealing a sanctuary within. First, Roy saw an abundance of plants growing around the space behind the door, and a brightly lit corridor stood before them. It felt warmer inside, and the air tasted fresh. Whoa, is this your secret base? Roy looked around, seems lived in. There's a bed made of hay and blanket, a doused bonfire, a rack, and a simple bookshelf. Yes, I'd come here for some peace and quiet. She held the witcher's hand. As promised, I'll show you a surprise. She took him through the corridor, and they entered the inner chamber of the mountain. Standing before them was an indoor garden bustling with greenery. Flowers bloomed, and streams gurgled down the surrounding walls of stone, slithering around the garden before flowing out of the cave. A hole opened up at the top of the cave, letting rays of sunshine rain down upon the garden. Roy felt like he just barged into a magical space, and then he saw a staircase made out of white marble standing within the garden. Sherry took him upstairs, and then Roy noticed an oil painting perched in the center of the mini plaza. It depicted a scene of two people sitting beside a stream, basking in the sunset and standing beside them was a watermill. They were huddled close together, their arms held high up in the air as they waved the butterflies goodbye. Roy could see the smiles hanging on the lips of that pair in the painting. The girl was sweet and lovely, while the boy was handsome and dashing. They looked like the perfect couple. Sherry stood before the painting, her eyes twinkling with delight. This is the surprise. It's a painting of us catching butterflies beside the watermill. Do you like it? Despite his impatience with her childish behavior, Roy still felt a little moved. Nobody else would do something like this for him. Not even Coral. And then he was reminded of the request the old fisherman told him. 
make her happy. Well, she's a likable girl. And he smiled. I love it. Didn't think you'd be as good a painter as you are a dancer. It's beautiful. I love it. Thank you, Sherry. He looked into her eyes. The girl clutched her chest and heaved a sigh of relief. She then spun around in delight once more, dancing beautifully like a ballerina. Good to hear. Now can I make my third wish? Of course. Roy looked at the painting and the girl in delight. She hesitated for a moment, then she swung her fists to bolster her courage. I'd like you to move into Redmount and be a part of the family. Everyone's more than happy to welcome you. Even Caroline. And then we can play all day. We can have breakfast together just like a family. Then we can play at the beach. And the falls. Then you can try to come up with some new dance moves for me at night. You came from the world beyond. You must have seen a lot of things in your life. So, how about it? Roy's smile froze. He took a deep breath and shook his head. Sherry, I can't. I told you I must find Sam. I have to leave this place. There are people out there waiting for me. They're important to me. I can't leave them behind. But why? Redmount is the best place in the world. There's no sickness or hunger here. Everyone's kind, and the weather is always sunny. All the color was drained from Sherry's face, and she took a step back. Sherry, I... It's me, isn't it? I'm Jew? Stat a stupid brat everyone hates. Just a stupid brat who thinks she can have everything she wants. You think my games are stupid and boring, don't you? Suddenly, she raised her head, and with determination in her voice, she spoke. But I promise I'll change. I'll make you happy. Sherry. The girl hugged her shoulders, shivering as if she was assailed by a chilly gale. I, I just want you to stay. If you leave, I'll be alone again. And I don't want that. Please, don't leave me. Roy remained silent, but when he heard the girl's thundering heartbeat, he changed the subject. Sherry, I have a few questions for you. Ever since I came into the village, something has felt off. You know what I'm talking about. The perpetually setting sun, the villagers who somehow act the same, and why would you be alone without me? I have something to tell you, worriedly, she said, but I don't want you to hate me. They did. I won't. What is she talking about? And everyone likes you, don't they? They weren't like this a long time ago. I changed them. She hung her head low, whispering, I never wanted to keep them here, but this is the only way to make sure they love me. I, is that believable? Wait, what do you mean keep them here? Roy's heart sank. I think I know why I can't teleport away now. What's that supposed to mean? I'll explain. The girl let out a sigh. A moment of silence swept down on them, and then, with a shivering voice, she recounted her past. A long time ago, everyone in the village hated me. Every time I'd walk down the streets, the men would give me weird stares, stares filled with lust, like they wanted to tear my clothes off and gobble me up. And the women would give me hate-filled looks, called me a whore behind my back. They would spit at me every chance they had. Roy was in disbelief. That's how the villagers used to treat her? But they're so kind. This sounds impossible. What happened? All because I looked different from them. Caroline said I was too beautiful. Roy interjected. I thought they started liking you because you found a mind for them and enriched their lives. That's what they think. What I want them to think. Wait, what? Roy had a sinking feeling in his stomach. Everything changed after that old man died. Sherry crouched and held her knees with her hands, and she rested her chin on her knees, base, her eyes spacing out. With sorrow in her voice, she said, An old man went by my house one day. I was basking in the shade by the front of my home when, all of a sudden, he grabbed my hand and started touching my legs. In all my terror, I shoved him away, and he fell. The moment he did, his heart stopped beating. But everyone said and murdered him, accused me of using witchcraft on him, called me a whore. Roy massaged his temples. He couldn't imagine the kind, helpful villagers were nothing but beasts controlled by their lust and envy in the past. They used to be nothing but an ignorant mob. Wait, maybe that's the truth. That's what most villagers are supposed to be like. The kindness they showed was nothing but a mask. Sherry started trembling, and when she looked at Roy again, there were tears in her eyes. Sadly, she said, they knew it was a lie. I would never hurt anyone, but they framed me. They had plans for me. And what happened? They took the body away and barged into my house at night. Caroline and I were sleeping, and then they tried to take me away by force. 
I screamed. I cried. Caroline came to my defense and slapped the man who tried to take me away, and, and he whipped out a knife. Mother tried to hold it, but she was too weak. And then he killed your mother, Roy asked calmly, but the flames of fury burned in his eyes. No, he stabbed her in the stomach, but he did it again and again, and all of a sudden, I saw blood everywhere. The floor, the walls, my clothes. Tears trickled down her cheek. And then, realizing what they had done, the villagers ran away. Then they lit our house up. I held Caroline and hid in the corner. All I could smell was smoke. My lungs felt like they were on fire. I couldn't breathe, and... And then Sam, the statue on the necklace I took, spoke to me. Wait, Sam is a pendant, and you've been wearing it all this time? Roy's eyebrow twitched, and he held his fury down. No wonder he told me to take the necklace. Yes, I saw it in this very garden. It was lying in the center of this plaza. Sherry's eyes shone with reminiscence. I fell in love with it the moment I laid eyes on it. Ever since then, I've been taking it around with me. She touched the center of her chest, and Roy saw something bulge. I didn't tell you because I was worried you might leave the moment you have it. What did it tell you that night? That it could change everything for the better. That it could grant all my wishes. All I had to do was open my heart to him. Wait, did he possess the girl? Roy had a grim look on his face. What is Sam? And what did it do to the village? I agreed, and then everything turned black. I fell asleep, it seemed. The light of delight and disbelief shone in her eyes. And when I woke up, I saw my home, still bright and beautiful as ever. Mother was no longer bleeding. Instead, she was sitting on my bed, holding me in her arms. She told me I had a bad dream, said I should look around now, and I did. It was how I found out that things did change. Nobody was calling me names anymore. Nobody hated me anymore. They saw me as family. Everyone loved me. I was happy. What about the mine? A figment of my imagination. Everyone then thought I did find one. It just made for a more believable story, don't you think? Roy was happy that things changed for the better for her, but he was also worried. So the perpetual sunset is your idea too? You control everything in the village? Sherry buried her chin deeper in her knees and she pursed her lips. So why are you still not happy? Redmount is perfect, but it's different from the outside world. The statue controls all the people in Redmount. Everyone is just doing what I want them to do. She stared down, just like puppets do. It's Prue perfect. I keep telling myself that nothing is better than this, that I'm going to live a happy life with everyone forever, that I'm happy. But then she said, still I eventually realized something was off. Everyone does what I tell them to do, even Caroline. She took a deep breath, and with a breaking voice, she whispered, it feels like I've been playing with myself all this time. Until you showed up, I noticed you the moment you came into the village. Sherry stared at Roy, her eyes filled with passion. You aren't the first outsider, but everyone else loses their individuality after a while. They turn into puppets, but you didn't. You still have a mind of your own. No, perhaps I've been influenced as well. Can you return everything to how it was, then? If I plead with Sam, perhaps. But everyone's going to disappear if I do that. They've lived many years without going sick or growing old. They've probably lived longer than a normal human should, she said. Or maybe they're going to hate me again if I return everything to normal. And you'll leave me. I'll be alone again. Sorry, but I can't do it. Stay with me, Goldie. Sherry. Roy scanned the garden once more before he turned his gaze to the girl. And he sighed. Ask yourself. Do you want to live in this utopia of your own imagining, or do you want to end everything and see the world for what it is? Yes, it's going to be a lot harsher than Redmount, but it's going to be a lot more interesting, Roy said. If you can't do it, then take Sam's necklace and leave this place with me. I, I'm scared. The girl was hyperventilating, her fingers and teeth chattering, and she hissed in fear. What will happen to Redmount if I dismantle everything? Everyone will be gone. What if you leave me too? I won't. Roy stared into her eyes and he promised, If I can leave this place, I'm taking you with me. I swear, on my name as a witcher. Maybe you're right. Sherry found a sliver of courage within her and she muttered, You've been kind to me, patient too, helped me with my wishes and gave me the happiest day of my life, but you might disappear once I give Sam to you. I'm scared. I don't want you to die. 
I won't, I promise. Roy extended his hand again. Okay, I trust you, Goldie. The girl slid her hand into her shirt and held her necklace, and then she froze. Sam spoke to me again. What did he say? A nervous Roy asked. That red mount will change if I give it to you. A minute, please. Roy changed his mind, all because the girl said she trusted him. I'll stay around for a while, see if we can leave this place without changing anything. Sherry remained silent for a long time. Then she raised her head and smiled at him. It was a beautiful smile, like a flower growing into full bloom only to wilt moments later. It's all right, I've made up my mind. Even though she was smiling, tears couldn't stop streaming down her cheeks. With a trembling finger, she wiped them away. You're right, I shouldn't live in my own lie anymore. I should see the world. She huddled closer to Roy, her ponytail swaying in the air, and with anticipation, she stared at him. You will take me with you, won't you? I will. She handed the pendant to Roy and stuffed it into his hand with enough force to almost bury it in his flesh. The girl decided to put all her trust in the Witcher. Roy opened his hand and saw the statue of a strange man. It was the same mage he saw back in the inn, but then the statue changed into a grotesque humanoid creature filled with bony spikes and a hardened hide. Flashes of red and black shone upon it, and its goat horns were curled to the back, the pattern of a black rose adorning its face. A devilish smile curled the monster's lips. You got me. Well done. Here's your reward, but hold her tight. Don't let her run away. It winked at the witcher. As if struck by lightning, the witcher was trembling all over. I don't feel so good, Goldie. Sherry frowned, and she started losing her strength. Roy tightly held the pendant and quickly held her in his arms. Nervously, he looked at her. Where does it hurt? Everywhere. Help me. Something's burning me. It hurts. Help me. Her face was contorting at a blistering rate, her skin starting to crack like it was porcelain. And then blisters started to form. Then the blisters broke into burns and formed scabs. The girl let out a scream of agony. Hold on, Sherry. I'll save you. Roy held her tightly in his arms, even though she was scalding hot. A hint of madness welled in his eyes, and he quickly opened up his inventory, the acorn. He fed the acorn to her with reckless abandon and waited with bated breath to see if it would work. It did not. The girl changed even further. Her skin became blood red and started melting away, revealing the ruined muscles and bones within. Sherry's screams echoed across the air, and the pendant unleashed a stream of white-hot fire. It engulfed them, and everything around them rumbled. The witcher heard an explosion in his head. Is this the end? Everyone around was shaking, melting away. Something squeezed the witcher's heart, suffocating him. He felt like he was trapped on a cliff, surrounded by roaring waters. The only thing he could do was to hold the girl tight in his arms, and he curled up, not even moving, not even looking. The only thing below him was the abyss, and howling gales of death. He felt the winds cutting through his skin, tormenting his spirit. And yet he held on to the girl in his arms. An eternity later, the pain slowly went away, and around him was raucous laughter. Who are you? What did you do to her? I am Sanguine. As per her wish, I returned her to her original form. Part of it is thanks to you. Most of it is her greed, though. If she had just stayed in the village, then none of this would have happened. She could have lived a happy life until my power was exhausted. But you awakened her greed and pushed her to destroy everything. I expected no less from the champion O, F4 drinking contest. Now you may claim your prize. She is yours. The white light faded away, and the witcher opened his eyes. He could feel himself bleeding all over his face. Even after he used his charge of activate, he only had less than 10% of his HP and mana remaining. What is this place? He was in a desolate ruin. Weeds grew everywhere, and the house around him was charred, and all the buildings around him were broken down. Before the dilapidated door were piles of human bones, bones that had existed for years. Most of them were gone, leaving thin, spindly remnants behind. This place must have been abandoned for a century. It's nothing but ruins now. So that village, all those villagers, were they just an illusion? He looked at the pendant before him, and for some magical reason, the pendant turned into a sword. It had a cross-shaped crossguard, and its blade was covered in runes. That's the one I saw in the inn. Wait, why didn't my acorn save Sherry? 
Sherry was still lying in his arms, and she was dying. Like the village, she was almost destroyed. Burns covered her whole body, and her face resembled something from a horror show. Only her left eye remained. It was still gleaming brightly. I remember now, Goldie, she whispered. The last of her life was quickly leaving her, and this flower of youth would soon wilt. I died the night my house was burned down. She extended her left hand and placed it in the witcher's hand. With her other hand, she feebly touched the witcher's cheek, and she whispered, Don't cry, Goldie. Don't, don't leave me. I won't, and her arm went limp. The girl closed her eye as she drew her last breath, and then her body broke into shards of light. Like butterflies, they fluttered into the sword. A silhouette appeared above the blade. Roy recognized her. It was Sherry, and she looked as beautiful as she was before the tragedy. She leapt around as if she was trying to catch a bug, and the spirit smiled at Roy. As if given life, the sword glimmered and shone. There was a name engraved on the hilt. Roy didn't recognize it back at the inn, but now he knew what the sword was called. Sherry. Chapter 478. Daedroth and Soul Weapon. A gust of wind traveled across the ranch, danced through the top of Whiterun, and whispered into the room of Dragon's Reach. Sanguine, why do you wish to know of it? Ferengar looked at the trio grimly, rubbing his hand on the Dragonstone. I think we ran into its avatar in the Bannered Mare. Arvel gulped. He disguised himself as one Sam Gouven and joined a drinking contest. Then he spirited the winner, Goldeneye, away. We have no idea what Sanguine did to him. He's been a bit off these few days. Ferengar turned his attention to Roy. The mercenary seemed to have gone through something traumatic. He seemed out of it, and his eyes were dim, unlike what they used to be. And he saw a sword strapped to his back, a sword with a pommel made of ruby. He didn't have that sword the last time we met. I used to study at the College of Winterhold, looked into magic and all kinds of stories and legends. I have heard of the name Sanguine. The mage said, our world is not home to only humans, monsters and dragons. Something even more powerful resides in our plane of existence. Are you talking about the Nine Divines? Akatosh, the dragon god of time, Dibella, the goddess of beauty and freedom, Arke, the god of the cycle of birth and death, and our god Talos. Flynn straightened his collar out, a hint of worship glimmering in his eyes. Temples and altars dedicated to these gods exist all over Skyrim, and altars can grant blessings for believers. The believers of these divines possess incredible power. That is proof of the divine's existence. Sanguine is not a divine, Ferengar said, but in some ways it is similar to a divine, so it is a god as well. But these gods have jurisdiction over things that are unsavory to most people. Some are even downright evil. Deception, conspiracies, plague, madness, oaths, and curses. Sanguine is the prince of depravity and corruption. These gods are called the Daedric Princes, and as far as I know, there are sixteen of them. Stress lines appeared on Ferengar's cheeks. It doesn't matter which kind of god you ran into, they are not the kind of existence we can fight. Daedric Princes especially. Divines rarely appear before mortals, but Daedric Princes don't follow that rule. They live in oblivion primarily, yet they can manifest themselves in different worlds, including Tamriel, through their avatars, but outside of Oblivion, their power is limited. Wait a minute, so you're saying a Daedric Prince came to the inn, got into a drinking contest, and lost to Goldeneye? Flynn paled. Perhaps it was just trying to entertain itself. Gods aren't as distant as you think. Sanguine is the prince of corruption and depravity. It loves to travel through worlds, have some fun. Immortality tends to bore you out, and it loves to play. A pause later, Ferengar added, some people worship it, though, and there are altars to Sanguine. Wherever it appears, danger follows, and riches. Sanguine has left many stories in the lands of Tamriel. It would pick a few lucky ones and put them through a series of trials just to entertain itself. Should the chosen ones pass, they would receive valuable and special rewards, weapons, armor, or something else. And if they fail? Not sure. No records of it. Ferengar sighed, and he looked at Roy. Goldeneye came back in one piece, so that's the good news. Want to tell us what you saw in Sanguine's domain? And is that weapon you carry its reward? I ran into one of the Diedrich princes. Gods can manifest themselves in this world. Back in my world, gods have disappeared for eons. Roy took a deep breath, and his eyes began to twinkle. 
It sent me to that happy village and made me destroy a girl's dream just for fun. Roy was reminded of a certain entity he met back in the Witcher world, the Master of Mirrors. Roy wondered if that girl in Redmount actually existed. No. The ruins I woke up in must be where Redmount used to be, and Sherry's strapped to my back. But how much of the story is true? Is the whole story about the villagers' har assment of Sherry and her mother's murder real? Or is it just something Sanguine came up with to torture me? If it was real, then that meant I destroyed Sherry's peaceful life. Roy looked at his companions, who were eager to hear his story. A while of hesitation later, he recounted his tale through Arvel. The story came as a harrowing surprise for his companions. They were in disbelief, shock, and awe. And in the end, they sighed. So Sherry died in that fire, but Sanguine revived her and made a utopia for her. Flynn asked. But why? An experiment, perhaps. The princes treat humans like how we treat insects. A hint of sorrow flashed in Ferengar's eyes. But no matter what, Sanguine did help the girl. It revived her and kept her locked in that village, created the perfect cage for her and observed her life like she was its pet bird. And then, on a whim, it tossed Goldeneye into this game. What did the villagers go through anyway? Asked Arvel. Probably killed off, said Flynn. They deserved it. They had no right asking for mercy when they showed none to an innocent girl, especially not mercy from a prince. Pity Sherry was dragged into this. She was kind and beautiful like a princess from a fairy tale. Arvel shook his head. He was reminded of someone, and he fell silent for a moment. She had received nothing but pain in this world. I think I know how you feel, Goldeneye. Flynn patted Roy's shoulder. But I don't think you should blame yourself. You granted her wish. She's tired of her boring life in Redmount, tired of her fake utopia. It was why she wanted to release the butterflies. She, too, wanted change, and you released her from her cage. The dragonborn peered at Roy's blade, and you fulfilled your promise. You took her with you. Roy looked at the dragonborn. He was surprised that this honest man had a sensitive heart beneath that rugged exterior. The witcher held the hilt of Sherry and unsheathed it, then he presented it to his companions. Sherry, a sword made by Sanguine in its boredom, type, ebony blade, components, ruby, bear pelt, ebony ingot, sole, specs, weighs 3.6 pounds, hilt measures 9 inches, blade measures 35 inches. Affix, guardian, whenever you hold this blade, you gain Sherry's protection and assistance in battle plus 10% to all stats under 20 points. Levels up any skill you have, level 4 or below, or elevates one of Arendite's affix that have not been strengthened more than twice. Soul gem at full capacity. Energy will be reduced according to usage. This is a marvelous enchantment. Powerful, too, Ferengar said. Not even the best enchanter in Cyrodiil can do this. But how did she turn into a sword? How did a human body turn into metal? Arvel asked. How does this work? There's only one possibility I know, said Ferengar. Every time you use this sword, you'll have to spend its energy. And this sword is powered by Sherry's soul. Do you know what this means? Every time you swing this blade, you'll be exhausting the girl's soul. Ferengar looked at the Witcher. Goldeneye, will you use this blade until Sherry's soul is erased, or will you use it as a decoration? The latter will keep the girl's soul intact. A long silence fell upon them. Roy stared at the runes on the blade. He didn't spend much time with Sherry. There was no love or romance between them, but she did show him great kindness and warmth during the short time he was in that village surrounded by a perpetual sunset. She felt like a fairy, untainted by this world, like a little sister Roy wanted to protect. The Witcher took a deep breath and asked, If I destroy this blade, will her soul be free, or will she go somewhere else? Arvel voiced that question out. Farangar mused over it. Nordlings can only go to Sovngarde if they die in battle. Beastmen can only travel to Hercene's hunting grounds after they die. And only those who thirst for knowledge can enter the library of Hermaeus Mora. The divines and princes can be picky about who they let into their domain. Oh, Enli Arke, the god of the cycle of birth and death, accepts everyone. Most people go to Arke after their deaths and they will be sent into the cycle, reborn in Tamriel or elsewhere. So Sherry has a chance to be reborn? Not exactly. She opened her heart to Sanguine before her death, and he has left a mark on her. Even if you destroy the sword, 
she might just return to Sanguine and once again become its toy, and her soul might power another blade, turning her into yet another prize for the next player, and then they're going to use that sword until nothing is left of her soul. I'd advise against destroying the sword. You need to buy a house, Flynn held Roy's shoulder. Excitedly, he said, use her to decorate your home, then she can watch over you forever. Roy brushed his hand across the blade, and he felt goosebumps all over the back of his hand. There was something talking to him through the blade. And he saw a girl with blonde hair and green eyes standing before him. She had a big smile on her face, and the girl spun around happily. Roy held the blade up and mused over his decision. Flynn and Arvel exchanged a look. So, anything new about the Dragonstone? Still deciphering. We'll go to the inn. See you once we settle this matter. Roy returned to his room in the bannered mare and plopped down on his bed, then he concentrated on his character sheet. Bound weapons, Erendite, Guer, you have one unused power-up, you now have two more enchanted weapons, ancient Nordling honed axe of cold, and sherry. You also have a soul that has full trust in you. You may now choose from the following options. 1. Absorb ancient Nordling honed axe of cold and increase an affix slot for your bound weapons you will also gain a new affix. Frostbite. Every time you hit a target, you have a low chance to deal cold damage, slowing the target's speed and reaction. 2. Spend 3,000 pure souls, EXP, and 300 mana to merge sherry into your weapon, creating a special space that can house a soul weapon. Your bound weapon will receive a soul, granting it a hint of life. The weapon will also gain a soul power. Guardian. Whenever you hold this blade, you shall receive Sherry's aid in battle, plus 10% to all stats lower than 20 points, and level up any single skill lower than level 4. Power up an affix that has only been strengthened twice or less. You may swap the level up once per day. Note, every time your weapon powers up, its soul will grow as well, but at the cost of more pure souls. Roy was surprised at the new options. He did wonder if his weapons would gain a mind of their own if he kept powering them up, and now his hypothesis was proven to be true, though in a different way, so it'll gain a soul, no doubt from Sherry. Then Sherry can stay with me forever and grow as I do. Wonder what she's gonna think. Will she do it? What if I find a way to revive her? What if I find a way to let her live? If I merge her with Erendite? Sherry suddenly shivered. She was sending a message to Roy. She wants to stay with me, huh? I did make that promise back at Redmount. But do you really want to come with me? I'll be traveling the lands of different worlds. Sherry trembled again. Very well, Roy touched the blade with both hands. XP 3500 500. A pair of swords appeared around him. One had a glimmering blade and intricately carved crossguard, and its fuller jutted out, forming a long and sharp pyramid. The other was as crimson as blood. Unlike Guire, it had no ornaments or decoration. It was as simple and quiet as an undisturbed lake. Guer, ancient Nordling honed acts of cold absorbed, affixes, circulation, ignite, painful strike, teleport, elevated, suppression, elevated, devour, elevated, frostbite new. Erendite, ebony sword absorbed, soul power, guardian, stat and skill unpicked, affixes, mana reduction, aqua blessing, aqua summoning, teleport, elevated, suppression, elevated, devourvated. Roy touched both blades, and he felt a surge of warmth flowing into his fingertips. He warmth then coursed through his veins. It felt like someone was hugging him gently, supporting him with their power. And then, he felt strength welling within him. Strength, 15, 16.5. Dexterity, 15.5 to 17. Perception, 12, 13.2. Charisma, 9, 9.9. 10% increase. A single stat increase would be nothing, but this skill affects every stat under 20 points. And if I keep leveling up, the skill's restriction would be loosened and I can also level up one of my skills or affixes. Devour, elevated. Let's do this. Devour, elevated rank two. White light enveloped the blade, and a seventh star appeared on the fuller. Now the stars truly resembled an Ouroboros. Devour was Roy's strongest offensive ability thus far. At this point, he knew Devour alone could slash through a dragon's hide and gravely injure it, and he could also switch the power-up to any other skill that was below level four including but not limited to sword mastery, crossbow mastery, witcher signs, and witcher senses. And just like this, and just like the stat restriction,
the limits of this skill as he leveled up. Guardian was an impressive skill, though it required a lot of EXP to level up. Now I have two ways to spend my EXP. Either I level up, or I level Guardian up. Roy swung his blade around and crouched a little. Then he swung his sword in a way the people of this world would. The air hissed, and flashes of light arced through the air. Arendite felt livelier than usual. It would correct the Witcher's every movement, perfecting it and making it easier to perform. Another swing later, the blade trembled like the wings of a butterfly, and then he heard someone talking to him. Sherry? I promised I wouldn't leave you. We're going on an adventure together. I'll take you across worlds, show you all there is to see. And he heard a silvery laughter travel across the air. Roy smiled. He then whipped out some grease and a piece of cloth, then he slowly wiped the grease on his blade. From now on, he wouldn't tuck his blade away in his inventory unless absolutely necessary. Chapter 479 The Path of Thulm The twin moons of Tamriel traveled across the night, raining down silvery light upon the land. Within the inn sat a witcher, his expression calm. Lying beside him was his beloved weapon, Arendite. With Sherry's matter out of the way, he now focused his efforts on the issue of Thulm. I'll get Ferengar to appraise Arendite tomorrow, but now this takes precedence. It's been a hectic few days, but I should get back to the shouts now. It's as powerful as a soul weapon. Since Roy was no dragon or dragonborn, he had one hurdle to overcome if he wanted to learn a shout, amelioration of his soul. He needed to close the distance between his soul and a dragon, and I have to find out what bones of the earth means. Gotta learn how to use its power. Once again, he was in the world of meditation, and a black hole as large as the sun hung in the skies, spilling out magicka everywhere. Standing beneath the skies was a minute silhouette. A silhouette belonging to the Witcher. Just as the manual taught him, Roy constructed a great being in his mind. A creature as monumental as a mountain, one with scales and claws as dark as night. Its elongated head had two claws protruding at the front, curling backward, and its jaw was lined with teeth sharp enough to tear anything to shreds. The creature's eyes were devoid of emotion, yet filled with crimson violence. It flapped its wings, and its shadow covered the land in fear. The creature was none other than Alduin, the dragon Roy saw in Helgen. It was the only dragon Roy had seen, so he had no other references. Fortunately, the fear Alduin struck in his heart also left Roy with a perfect photographic memory of its appearance. Roy calmed his mind and imagined himself slowly changing into a dragon. First, it was his fingertips. He imagined a sharp, curled talon protruding out of the end of his index finger. Then it was his middle finger. Then his ring finger. All of a sudden, the Witcher stood on all fours on the bed like a beast, his shoulders, torse, torso, and legs trembling like he was a butterfly trying to break out of its cocoon, like a falcon breaking free of its egg, like a snake shedding its skin. Dark shadows covered the Witcher, his legs slowly turning into claws, his mouth elongating into a snout. Horns jutted out of his forehead, and Roy's head turned into a dark dragon's head, his golden eyes replaced by a crimson gleam. A pair of spikes tore through the skin of his arms, slowly pushing outward into the air, and an unspeakable agony enveloped Roy. The pain came not from his skin, his muscles, nor his bones. The pain came beyond his flesh. It was his soul. His soul cried out in agony. It was as if a thousand knives were cutting away at his soul, but Roy would not falter. He must stay awake and make sure his soul slowly turned into the shape of Alduin, and he was the only one who could do that. His bones were growing in size, and a pair of wings made of bones replaced his arms, fleshy webbing slowly covering the gaps between each bone. Finally, his dragon wings came into form, and his elder blood filled the little holes within his soul. Just like that, a miniature Alduin was born. Even with Roy's extraordinary will, half the agony still took everything his soul had. The little dragon lay on the ground, huffing and puffing. A long, long while later, the little dragon turned its attention to the hole that was still pouring out magicka. It could feel the particles in the air swimming in, as if its body were a magic magnet. So this is the soul of a dragon? No, I'm only wearing the skin of a dragon. I lack its bones, its essence. I must observe dragon bones up close. Even though it only had the shape of Alduin, Roy could feel a great change stirring within him. 
he could use the magicka in this void like they were a part of his body. Once again, he produced the shout he saw at the word wall. Fuss! A wave of power surged from the dark ground beneath Roy, but all he managed to create was a gust of breeze. Fuss! Not enough. Even now when my soul looks lie, key a dragon, I still can't unleash a shout. I lack something. But he gained some knowledge from this attempt. The force unleashed by unrelenting force came not from Magicka, but from the ground. The miniature Alduin slowly sank into the dark ground below. It was something Roy had never done before. All this time, he chased after the things floating above his head, thinking he would find the source of magic there. The dimension of elements and the whole were the things he had been chasing after, but never did he try sinking his soul into the ground beneath him. In Dragon Tongue, this place was called the Bones of the Earth. What are the Bones of the Earth, anyway? Skyrim or Tamriel? The further he sank into the ground, the more the light was blotted out. Roy's soul kept sinking further into the depths. Around him was nothing but darkness. Even time itself came to a halt in this space. Fear welled within Roy, but he held it down and kept sinking deeper. Eventually, the light was fully blotted out, and he felt a connection welling within. It felt like something had come in touch with his soul, and through it, a legacy swam into his mind. A legacy that told of an ancient story. In the beginning, there was nothing. Nothing but chaos and the void. Then, a bright ball of light engaged the void in a violent clash, and in the end, the ball of light split into three parts. One tore through the void and created a great hole that spilled Magicka endlessly. In the skies it sat, shining brilliantly like a beacon that guided all things in life. Another flew into the ever-changing plains of oblivion, while the final part stayed and formed a great sphere in space. Surrounding the planet were eight of the brightest stars in space and a pair of beautiful moons. This planet was the world where Tamriel stood. Looks a bit like the story of creation, eight stars. That aligns with the eight divines. Talos is the manifestation of humanity. He doesn't count. So the divines created this world. Then what of the light that flew into oblivion? The Daedric princes? And what of the light that flew into that bright world? Roy had a lot of questions, but he was not sure if he wanted to know the answers. And then the scene disappeared like a bubble, replaced by skeletons the size of mountains. What manner of creature these skeletons used to be in life was indiscernible, and yet one thing was clear. These skeletons were thousands of times larger than dragons themselves, and these bones had merged with the very earth. Roy felt a sense of sorrow and sadness well in his heart, and he understood what these skeletons belonged to. These were the bones of the earth. The remains of the eight divines after they sacrificed themselves to create the world. And then he saw sanguine in crimson, spiked armor. The clash of the lights he saw told him of a shocking truth. The Daedric princes and divines are one and the same, and Alduin shares some similarities with them. The three of them were kin, but they battled over their differences and broke their bond. Yet the power they possess are the same. Alduin's a bit weaker, though. Dragons using the power of the bones is just them using their own power. Of course it comes easily to them, and the miniature Alduin opened its mouth. Fuss! This time, Roy seemed to have found the secret to the shout. A minuscule part of the great skeletons resonated with the shout, and it vibrated. Though it was so small, Roy almost missed it. Yet this little vibration brought with it a violent air current powerful enough to smash through the void. Fuss, Roy grunted, and his eyes snapped open. The rays of dawn shone upon his face, glistening with sweat. He was breathing heavily, his eyes wide with shock, and the veins on his neck popped. For a moment, he thought everything he saw was just an illusion, but he knew that wasn't true. Roy felt as if he was inches away from death, and he remained on his bed for half an hour before he finally turned his attention to his character sheet. Then a smile curled his lips. Good. At least I'd I didn't go through that for nothing. A new skill glimmered on his character sheet. You have ameliorated your soul. For a brief moment, you closed the gap with Alduin and saw the truth of the bones of the earth, the remains of divines, the very land you stand upon. You have successfully cast a shout. Thum level one. You have learned unrelenting force, force. Every time you shout, 
the bones of the earth will unleash its energy and push away anything or anyone that stands in your way, knocking them off balance and destroying them. This skill costs no mana to spend, but every time you shout, your soul will enter an exhausted state. Only time can heal your soul. How frequently you can use this skill depends on how powerful your soul is. You are now level 12. Your soul has gone through 12 power-ups. Thuum's cooldown is now 24 minutes. Thuum doesn't need any mana or EXP? Wait, so the power of my soul is the only thing it requires? Roy was surprised that a skill this powerful expended almost nothing, and it told him valuable information hitherto unknown to him. So every time I level up, my stat and skill points aren't the only thing I gain. My soul gets powered up too. After 12 power-ups, his soul was already a lot more powerful than most people's. And he had level 10 meditation, and his elder blood had some similarities with dragons. Only then could he ameliorate his soul. But now, after that successful shout, he had another concern. Shouts utilize the power of the bones, the remains of those who created this world. Does this thing even exist in other worlds? Roy wondered if he could still use shouts after he went back to the Witcher world. Can I use the bones through space? Best not to think about it. Not my biggest concern right now. He hopped off his bed and stretched his arms. I can't wait to try the shout out, but I don't want to destroy this place. Don't want to wake everyone up either. Roy strapped Arendite to his back and left his room. Then he descended the stairs. It was about three or four in the morning, and Whiterun was in a deep sleep. The charcoal in the center of the inn had no embers left and the servants and guests were nowhere to be seen. Hulda's probably sleeping too. Roy left the inn and walked down the street, passing a few patches of mountain flower. He took in the morning's air and came to the inn's backyard. There he saw someone practicing his swordplay, and it was a familiar someone. Roy smiled. Flynn. The dragonborn was swinging his sword and shield around. He hid behind his shield and charged ahead into an imaginary enemy. As if his enemy had faltered, the dragonborn thrust his sword forward and quickly hid behind his shield once more. He then listened closely, as if his enemy was moving. Stepping aside, he swung his blade again. The dragonborn then quickly held his shield up and turned around to charge ahead. He swung his shield around him and turned around once more, this time to step aside. Then he swung his blade forward again. He was clumsy, and his basics were poor, Yet there was determination in his eyes. His movements were filled with energy, and his attacks were swift. Roy thought he could easily deal with a couple of Whiterun soldiers at this stage. He sneaks away to practice while Arvel and I are asleep. Time to teach him a little thing in life. Hey, Goldeneye, you're early. The Witcher stared at him, saying nothing. A nervous Flynn stared at the ground, fidgeting. I wanted to train. You and Arvel are a lot more powerful than I am. I can't keep dragging you guys down, or we can't go on adventures together anymore, so I thought I should train hard. At least he's earnest. Roy patted Flynn's shoulder and nodded, telling him to continue. Then he summoned his loyal servant. A few minutes later, Arvel showed up all decked out in leather helm and armor, though he was yawning. He and the dragonborn started training, and it was intense. Only when both of them were sweating profusely did they come to a stop. So what are you going to do with the sword, Goldeneye? Sit. The trio sat on the patch of grass behind the inn. The Witcher showed Arendite to his companions and told them what he did with Sherry. He didn't lend the weapon to them, of course. Soul weapons were a warrior's closest companion. They wouldn't let anyone touch it. What kind of place is Novigrad? I can't believe they can enchant without soul gems. Arvel fiddled with his sword, and Roy smiled. Man, I wished Sanguine had picked me. Flynn swung his sweat off. I had a strange dream, and in that dream, I was the one who went through the trial, and I was given a crimson staff. It was just a dream. Goldeneye's a lot smarter and more skillful than you are, and handsome too. Arvel shook his head. The prince had no reason to pick someone like you when Goldeneye is around. You have a point. We should see Ferengar now. Roy felt guilty for some reason. It felt like he just took something from Flynn and through Arvel he asked, So what next? Are you going to stay in Whiterun until Ferengar deciphers the stone? An excited Flynn gushed, I've figured out the things I got from the wall, 
It's a shout called unrelenting force, and it's engraved in my soul, like I was born with it. And then he looked confused. But I still lack something. If I want to use that shout, I will have to get close to a dragon once again, and Whiterun is at risk of another dragon attack. The dragonborn had changed. At first, he wanted nothing to do with dragons, but now he was chasing after them. His eyes were gleaming with a certain desire. Once I have that power, Jarl Balgruf is going to reward me handsomely, and I can find myself a wife. Roy wiped the sweat off his forehead. Flynn doesn't know he's a dragonborn just yet. And dragonborns should have higher ambitions than this. Arvel nodded. I've spent my whole life chasing after dragons, though I don't think I can ever master a shout. Flynn said, Hey, maybe I can teach you once I figure out the whole deal with shouts. Wouldn't that be great? Arvel grinned. We should drink up at the Bannered Mare more. Maybe we'll run into another prince. Ferengar did say there are sixteen of them. I'll stay with you guys. And the thief swung his arm happily. And perhaps they will call me Arvel the Dragon Slayer. That's the promise I made to my child. And he trailed off. There was sadness and longing in his eyes. Then he teared up a little. But after that, he looked at Roy with respect. Even without his child's wish, he couldn't go anywhere unless his master told him to. Good thing he's a reasonable master. Pardon me, but can you tell me more about your child? Didn't hear it back in the inn, but it's fine if you don't want to share. I had a daughter back when I was in solitude, but she died of an illness years ago. Still had a wish, though. The thief lived in solitude back when the High King was still alive. What kind of wish? It's related to a festival in solitude. It goes by the name of the Burning of King Olaf. Olaf? Flynn thought he knew what the festival was about. Yes, Olaf One-Eye, the first Jarl of Whiterun, Dragonslayer, and the ancestor of Jarl Balgruf. Arvel smirked. A long time ago, the Bard's College of Solitude thought the story of Olaf's dragon slaying was nothing but a lie, thought he was a liar, so every year, there is be a day dedicated to the burning of a straw man made in Olaf's image. It's the way they show contempt for liars. Roy and Flynn exchanged a look. Why did Skyrim's ruler let this festival go on? It's disrespectful to Balgruf. Wait, perhaps that's why Balgruf chose no sides in this war. It's his way of showing discontent. But not everyone in Solitude thought Olaf was a liar. Fran thought of him as a real hero who slayed a dragon. A gentle look welled in the thief's eyes. But she couldn't prove it. After all, dragons have been gone for thousands of years. The story of Olaf the Dragon Slayer is just a legend, a myth. Even when she was dying, still, I couldn't find proof of the story's veracity. All I can do now is venture through ruins to search for the power the Nordlings used to defeat dragons. Arvel took a deep breath, and now dragons are making their return. I must stay in Whiterun and witness the heroic act of dragon slaying. I must fulfill my daughter's dying wish. Flynn patted his shoulder with respect. Didn't take you for a more courageous man than I am, Arvel, but here you are. I'm going with you on this hunt. Dragon slaying is no easy feat. We need help from Whiterun soldiers, and even then, it's not enough. Roy was reminded of Alduin. The soldiers there kept shooting it with arrows, and yet it was to no avail. Barely a second later, Alduin had turned them into a crisp. We'll meet up with Ferengar, then I'll talk to Jarl Balgruf. Find out what Whiterun's strategy is. We can't just get swept into the flow of things, and perhaps we can get a little something for ourselves out of this. A house or something, perhaps. Roy told his companions to make their way to Dragon's Reach, while he fired off some bolts and blinked away. A few blinks later, Roy left the mountain where Whiterun stood, and he arrived at a big oak in the plains. It was about a hundred years old, and its canopy was far reaching enough to cover a small village. The Witcher concentrated and cleared his mind. His hands were placed on his waist, clenched into fists, and he bent his knee a little as he inhaled. In his mind, he imagined the shape of a creature of destruction. At the same time, a sliver of light slowly enveloped his armor, and his eyes turned a violent crimson. Slivers of black light surrounded him, and within that light was a black dragon, ready to let out a roar. Fus! Roy roared at the oak tree, and the dragon within the black light opened its maw as well. A minuscule part of the skeletal remains slumbering beneath the earth opened up, sending a surge of energy up to the surface, 
A violent wave of wind slammed away at the air before Roy. Roy took a deep breath and finally relaxed. I have my shout and twice elevated devour. I should be able to fight a dragon now. Roy turned around, and the oak behind him broke off through its center, revealing the ancient rings within the trunk. The remainder of the tree was uprooted, while the top half was sent flying into the distance. Its branches and leaves slammed heavily to the ground, playing a tune for the departing witcher. Chapter 480 Partnership The towering keep of Dragon's Reach basked under the golden sunshine of the morning. So Sherry's soul has been transferred into this sword? Unbelievable. I've read countless books on enchantments, and more than twenty of them claim that the injecting of souls into a weapon is irreversible. Transferring a soul into another weapon is impossible. A look of astonishment filled Ferengar's eyes, and he tried to touch Arendite. The Witcher cocked his eyebrow and held back the urge to smack the mage's hand away. How did you manage this, Goldeneye? Roy remained silent, but Ferengar wasn't angry. His eyes were still on Arendite, and he was astonished by what he found. These runes, they're completely different from what I know. It's different from the enchantments in Skyrim. No, the whole of Tamriel. Obviously. The inscriptions come from another world, and it's improved by my character sheet. This weapon is one of its kind. I've had it almost since I started adventuring, and it's gone through a lot of power-ups. I'm much stronger with the sword than I am without. Most enchanted weapons channel their souls and unleash it upon their target. It's how they unleash their power, but your weapon doesn't even have to use any souls at all. Wait, so that means every time it strikes, it takes energy from its user or perhaps its surroundings. This is akin to the permanent enchantments we usually find on armor. This proves that weapons don't need soul gems to recharge. It's a breakthrough. Oh, but then that makes triggering its effects a matter of chance. But if you use souls, the effects are always guaranteed. It's a trade-off for a permanent upgrade. Pros and cons, I say. Ferengar pinched his beard. Soul gems are for the rich, Arvel said. Most people, like me, prefer Goldeneye's style saves a lot of time and money. True, but that's not all about this sword. Lost in thought, Ferengar muttered, there are about six or seven enchantments on this sword at the same time, and yet they coexist peacefully, no fighting at all. The professor of enchanting back in College of Winterhold told me a weapon can only have two enchantments at most. Even the best enchanter in Tamriel can't break that rule. If they try to do that, they either render all enchantments ineffective or they break the weapon. I bet not even Hermias Mora's library contains knowledge of multiple enchantments on a single weapon. So who did this? Like a fanatic, Ferengar grabbed hold of Roy's hand. Might you be a master enchanter? Goldeneye comes from another land called Novigrad. It's probably something the people over there know. Flynn looked at Arondite, a look of astonishment filling his eyes. This sword is as powerful as Guire. He could still remember how easily Guire sliced through his enemies back in Bleak Falls Barrow. It was a shame Roy only lent him Guire that once. He has two powerful swords. Man, I wish I had two powerful weapons too. A shame I have to put all my efforts into deciphering the stone. We have to find the dragons as soon as possible. Ferengar sighed. Otherwise I would have taken my time to research this blade. I'm sure I can create a new school of enchantment eventually. May I have the sword for a while, Goldeneye? For research purposes? Roy shook his head and caressed his sword before sheathing it. This is my sole weapon. No way I'm letting you touch it. And Sherry won't agree to it either. Maybe next time, if I get more enchanted weapons. Roy was planning on getting more of the better armor here and paying Ferengar to enchant them. Ferengar looked at the sword and reluctantly calmed himself down. Sorry. I should have known you wouldn't tell me something so important so easily. Let's put the conversation to rest. So what next for you three? We'll stay at Whiterun, said Flynn, until you decipher that stone, until you find a weakness of the dragons. You'll be waiting for a while then. I have a question. As per their earlier discussion, Flynn asked, if a dragon were to attack Whiterun, what would the Jarl do? Just have his soldiers fire away at the dragon, and how many soldiers do you have? A few dozen? Hundreds? Honestly, if the dragon is as powerful as the one we saw in Helgen, everyone is going to die. 
but I don't think it will be as powerful as the one we saw, though it will still prove to be trouble. And why are you interested? None of you are citizens of Whiterun, as I recall. We saw a dragon butcher a whole city, killed a bunch of our brethren. We can't sit this one out, Flynn said. It was an excuse Roy suggested earlier. Besides, if we can kill a dragon, we'd be as famous as Olaf One-Eye, founder of Dragon's Reach. No one can resist that kind of glory. And once our names make it across Skyrim, every Jarl will welcome us with open hands. Ferengar shot them a look of surprise. It's like they're different people. I'd expect no less from heroes like you. Most people would be eager to run away from dragons after one attack, and yet you're running toward them. Very well, come with me to the lobby. Only the Jarl knows how we are going to deal with the dragon. Since you're lending your hand, you should listen to him. They entered the main chamber, and Farangar whispered to the Jarl. The Jarl shot the adventurers a sharp but approving look. We don't receive heroes every day here. Our soldiers are scattered across a few towns and villages. Some will have to stay back to defend the keep. If another dragon attack is imminent, we can only send out thirty, maybe forty soldiers at best. Farangar bowed. I despise combat, but I am the court wizard. Once the dragon makes its appearance, I shall join the front lines as well. Killing a dragon is out of the question, but at least we can destroy its body. Wait, what do you mean we can't kill a dragon? asked Flynn. Unlike common beasts, dragons are not affected by time. They are immortal. The most we can do is destroy their flesh, Balgroof boomed. Only those who are called dragonborns can irrevocably destroy a dragon. They are the only ones who can kill a dragon's soul. But alas, it has been many years since we last saw a dragonborn. Roy looked at Flynn, and the dragonborn scratched his head. Even now, he had no idea he was a dragonborn. But with him on our side, we have a chance to take down the dragon. Yet Roy chose to keep Flynn's identity a secret. Nobody would believe an honest Nordling like him was a dragonborn. Not without proof. And Roy wanted to find out if his character sheet had the special ability of the dragonborn to absorb a dragon's soul. Flynn scratched his head. Is dragonborn an important person, Jarl? Balgruf smiled. Dragonborns are worth nothing when the dragons remain in hiding. But now they are resurfacing, and dragonborns might just be the saviors of Whiterun, nay, the whole of Skyrim. They shall be treated as guests of utmost importance, no matter where they go. Balgruf continued. And it is all because dragonborns can strengthen themselves through the absorption of a dragon's core, and they are granted the talent to master something called shouts. They can use these shouts to fight even dragons. Balgruf seemed to know more about shouts than he let on. Humans can master shouts as well, but we have to work on it hundreds of times harder than a dragonborn. Is that so? Interested, Flynn asked. Jarl, as far as your knowledge extends, is there anyone else who knows how to cast these shouts? Of course. There is a group of people in Skyrim who saw it their duty to pass down the art of Thuum through generations, yet they keep to themselves. And then he sighed. In my youth, I made a pilgrimage, tried to see if they would teach me shouts, but all I did was waste my time. I wasn't cut out for the job, but Ulf, he didn't finish the sentence. There was envy, disgust, and respect in his eyes. Wait, someone else in Skyrim has mastery over these shouts? Wonder if I can get some pointers from them. Before Roy could say anything, Flynn asked, So how can we find these people, Jarl? No need for that. They will summon Taumak, he dragonborn to them, and teach them the way of Thuum, all to fend off the incoming dragons, Balgruf said mysteriously. And then, mockingly, he added, As for people like us, we should just keep to ourselves. Do not chase after what is not ours, or the only path that will lead us to is that of destruction. Roy fell into silence. Even if I showed my shout, I can't prove that I'm a dragonborn, and Balgruf might find me detestable. Besides, I still have a lot to learn about unrelenting force. Not in a hurry to find the next shout. And then, through Arvel, Roy said, Jarl, Steward Farangar, pardon me, but fending off a dragon with only a few dozen soldiers is insane. You expect to take down a dragon with nothing but arrows and magic? It's Adragon. It can burn your soldiers to a crisp easily, and it can tear us apart easily with its fangs and claws, and it can breathe fire and summon a meteor rain. Balgruf fell into silence, and Preventus tried to say something, but he couldn't. Farangar explained, 
Not all dragons are as powerful as the one in Helgen. According to my research, dragons are split into five tiers, each more powerful than the last. Dragon, Blood Dragon, Frost Dragon, Elder Dragon, and Ancient Dragon. The one you met in Helgen no doubt was at the top of the hierarchy. I suspect it was Alduin, the Bane of Kings, and the one who appeared in the First Era. That was a rare dragon, while the dragon we'll be facing is on the lowest rung of the hierarchy. No harm making more preparations. Do you have a plan? asked Arvel. Do you? Balgruf raised his hand, telling the thief to continue. Contact the other Jarls and form an alliance against these dragons. Falkreath, for example, it's the nearest hold. We have gone through that conversation. Preventus shook his head, sighing. The only sighting of a dragon was in Helgen, no news from the other holds. We don't know how many dragons will be attacking, nor do we know when they will attack. And we don't know why they're attacking either, Preventus said. They're coming in full force, and the Jarls prefer to keep their soldiers in their territory. We don't have any manpower to spare. Arvel took a deep breath and bowed to the people around the throne. I apologize, I did not think that far ahead. That is all right. Arvel, is it? Did you come up with those questions yourself? asked Balgruf. There was a look of approval for Arvel in his eyes. Goldeneye asked me to do it. Arvel hung his head low. It's what the three of us talked about. Flynn blushed. Not every day that I see a regular man keeping his cool in the face of an impending dragon attack. Most would either run away with their tails between their legs, or they would charge into battle recklessly. Balgruf nodded. It is still too early to work with the other Jarls. Any other ideas? Arvel looked at Roy. If we can't ask for help from the outside, why don't we turn to the people inside? We ran into John Battleborn in the inn. He said his family is a powerful one. They should be helping out, seeing as they are a part of the city. No. Balgruf shook his head, though he was obviously tempted by the idea. The Battleborns are my people, and I am the Jarl. I have a duty to protect them. I cannot ask my people to fight when my soldiers and I are still standing. It's not as simple as you think, Preventus explained. Things are complicated. Unless the dragon attacks Whiterun itself, the Battleborns have no reason to take to the front lines, nor do we have any reason to make them fight. But if Talos wills it, they might just send their troops to fight with us. Preventus continued. The Battleborns own a lot of farms and people, but the Grey Manes possess the best gear, though they are stubborn and traditional. And then there are the Companions, who are connected to the Grey Manes. We have no power over them. Preventus shot the adventurers a weird look, and he said, Goldeneye and Flynn have seen firsthand how the dragon attack in Helgen went down. If you can, persuade the families of White, run to lend their forces to us. Better if you use your experience to do so or even supply the soldiers with gear, you'd be heroes of the city, and you'll have clearance to do a lot of things here. The adventurers exchanged a glance. All right. That's what we're here for. We shall try our best. Now that Roy had a translator, mastered a conjuring spell, owned a soul weapon, and learned to shout, it was time to prepare for the fight with the dragon. The lowest tier, of course. He had to make sure he could collect some of its blood. And once the dragon was defeated, Everyone would see that Flynn was a real dragonborn. That alone would make traveling Skyrim damn easier. This partnership is essential to our plan.